I'm grateful for everyone who's here. Um, Jonathan and I are having a great conversation. Again, thank you for that intelligent conversation, Jonathan. I learned a lot. And I think we were in strong agreement that innovation has historically improved the condition of humanity by almost any measure, which doesn't mean it improves the condition for every single person. But on balance, innovation has been extraordinary, uh, as we all know, in terms of advancing the condition of humanity, which is our ultimate aim. And I think we're also in strong agreement that artificial intelligence, machine learning, and related terminology has similar potential. Um, but it also comes with very significant pitfalls. And our job is to think about these issues, national security implications, uh, implications around weapon systems, which is something we touched on, uh, privacy implications, ensuring that biases that we've worked so hard as a society to, to begin to overcome don't get hardwired into these systems, competitiveness implications, implications as it relates to the workforce, a whole portfolio of challenges and opportunities that we have an opportunity and we'll have many opportunities to shape the outcome for how these technologies unfold as it relates to each of them. And if we look back historically, we see the good collaboration between the public sector and the private sector has improved these outcomes. Having a transparent and open discussion about these issues has improved these outcomes. Um, and that has to be the spirit that we approach this next wave of innovation. Because it's happening very quickly, in some instances too quickly, and uh, we're behind the curve in many areas. So the work of this commission, together with works of similar bodies all over the world, is incredibly important to ensure that we have the right conversation and that we start thinking about the right policies in both government and the private sector. Uh, and we embrace the opportunities that uh, these technologies present, but also being clear-eyed and realistic and honest about the challenges. So I'm grateful to be part of this commission, and I look forward to today. Thanks, uh, John. Uh, I'll just make a couple of opening remarks and we'll get to our, our, our hearing today. Um, thanks again to uh, the folks at Clifford Chance. It's great to be here. Um, it's just great to be in London. What an exciting city, a historic city, um, so central to so much, so many important things that have happened in sort of the history of the world. So it's, um, it's marvelous to be here again. I love coming to London. Um, uh, many of you are aware that this, uh, this commission, uh, a creature of the United States Chamber of Commerce, we've been busy traveling all across the United States, having hearings. We've been in Austin, Texas. We've been in Cleveland, Ohio. We've been in Palo Alto, California. We've had some very, very interesting and helpful conversations. Um, and it's important for us to sort of take this to the next step, uh, which is the sort of humility and the understanding that what happens in the United States doesn't happen, doesn't stay in the United States and that decisions by uh, folks in the United States can have an impact all around the world. And just as decisions that are made here in London can have an impact all around the world. And it's important for us to coordinate it and have conversations. Um, that's why we're here in London. Um, it's important to bring that dialogue that we've been having in the U.S. to bring that abroad. Um, we have a very long and and proud history with the UK. Um, we have a great understanding of one another. We have a great, we have many uh, common Western values. Um, they're not shared by all around the world. So it's important for us to be in coordination and conversation as we try to um, uh, promote these values, uh, particularly when it comes to something as powerful as artificial intelligence. Um, um, Jonathan, I was struck by your comment, um, how it can be, I forget exactly how, should, how, how you said it, it can be, but tell, tell us again, AI could be, you were quoting some of the, the best, the worst thing, right? Stephen Hawking. I, w I was struck because when, when we were expecting, my wife and I were expecting our first child, someone said to me, parenthood is the best thing and the hardest thing you'll ever do in your life. And I thought to myself, how on earth can it be both? And it is. It has been, right? Um, our eldest is getting married at the end of the week now. And it has been the best thing and the hardest thing we've ever done. And 
I'm, I'm hopeful that artificial intelligence doesn't somehow become both of those things. We need to work so hard and make sure that we are doing everything we can to make it in service of humanity and uh, not a destructive force, right? Uh, and that is a big part of uh, what we're doing here today. So um, with that, we are going to get to our first uh, panel. Uh, I'll introduce our first panel and then uh, John and I will bounce back and forth. We're gonna switch. We're gonna switch. Yeah, we're just gonna have the first panel come kind of move down. Okay. Uh, if possible. So if you're on the first panel, on. Come on down, rearrange your seating if you, if you would. So I am head of strategy for Elsevier, uh, which is part of Relix, a FTSE 100 information and analytics company. Can you hear me okay? Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. um, I'll give you a brief background and then jump in. Um, so I've been with Elsevier for the last seven years. We are uh, an information company working across various professional B2B sectors. Before I, and I had strategy. Before that, I worked with Thomson Reuters, also in information, um, and before that at McKinsey. So over the last 20 years, I've worked in media and information sectors, always powered by technology. It's been really fascinating to see how these have been impacted by machine learning and P and of course AI. So it's a great privilege to be here today and share uh, some insights with you. So let me start by stating the obvious. I do believe that just like other advancements in technology, AI is and can be uh, a force for good um, and can help advance uh, society and the economy. It supports decision making in pretty much every field that I've worked in. Um, it allows us to process huge amounts of data um, very effectively and accurately, and it works across many use cases from process automation to medical um, triage to risk prediction. To name just a few examples. In my experience, AI helped us make great progress both internally within companies by deploying better operational methodologies and efficiencies, and externally by delivering better products. If you're an expert in your field, you know what an optimal decision flow looks like, what data you need, what you then, what analysis you apply on it, and what considerations or context you need to bring into the, the decision making. AI really helps codify that so we can make better decisions, better accuracy, better speed. It also leads to less waste and failure, um, especially in, uh, you know, there are less failed experiments in innovation, in pharma, developing drugs, um, and in the medical field with, with, with uh, inaccurate diagnosis. Um, and where I've seen some, I mean, medical for me, I should have said in my introduction, I worked in the medical sector for a number of years. Um, and it's been a really great way to reduce the unintended variability of care and deliver higher quality uh, medical diagnosis or treatments, especially in developing markets where access to expertise is more limited. And finally, AI tools like other um, like computers before them help free up the human, right? They take over some of the automated automation that can be done and free up people to do what only people can do. So all of these are great advantages. But of course, there are also risks, <laughs> and we've been seeing them, and we've been addressing them. And I do think that governments and parliaments um, should interrogate how how to protect public interest with new technology. So I really welcome you um, holding this session and inviting our experts today. Um, and this uh, this I think is not only right politically, but it's also right better for the economy and better for competition, because we all need a the right environment to operate in. So, potential policy problems associated with AI are well documented. Um, broadly speaking, I see five main problems. Number one, transparency and explainability. Does the user know they're interacting with an AI system and do they understand how it works? The latter can be quite problematic. Number two, accountability. When things go wrong, is there a clear line to a person to the right or to provide them? Number three, bias. You mentioned that, uh, Mr. Delaney. It is, I mean, what we say is that the decisions made using AI systems must not be based on data which contains historic biases. But what data doesn't? Um, and that's been a, a quite a substantial area of focus for us at Tracks and elsewhere. How do you mitigate that? Privacy. 
How can individuals ensure the continued legal control of their personal data within AI systems? And finally, IP. AI system impacts intellectual property in three ways. One is the input, the data and content. Second is the algorithm. And third is the output. And while I know that some say copyright law should be relaxed so that AI tools can progress, we actually feel the opposite is true. Without, without robust data uh, with high level of accuracies, AI systems will not produce safe and authoritative um, outputs. So we do believe that um, copyright system is necessary, necessary to provide uh, incentive for ensuring data quality. So these are, in my view, the main issues to address with safeguards. Some already have legislation that pertains to them, like the AI Act in Europe, or legislation specifically for privacy or other areas. But the sheer complexity and diversity of AI usage means that there are a number of cross-cutting areas of law. And we need to be quite careful in thinking about what legislative environment would be conducive and not staff for innovation. And I should also ask that, uh, add that a global approach uh, is very important for, certainly for a company like us, that works across geographies. Uh, Many companies, both those developing and those using AI tools, already uh, have put in place guardrails and, posi and policies to ensure responsible AI. But as I said, I mean, we welcome, I feel that companies should welcome the intervention of policymakers uh, for fair competition and clear guardrails for development. In cutting edge technology areas, companies are often or have been better positioned to think ahead of the implications of the technologies they're developing um, and to pivot or make changes or being stopped when needed. So I think, I mean, I think collaboration between, uh, as you said, collaboration between companies and regulators would be a great way forward. In some cases, there are paths that we can learn from uh, where companies have changed their approach to, uh, to accommodate um, or to deal with some of the risks that we see. So let me say a few words about how we approach responsible AI at Relix. <coughs> Um, we have a large cohort of professionals in data science, technology, and AI um, uh, who work uh, on various AI initiatives, both internally and externally. Pretty much every product we have now incorporates AI. Um, and we've defined a wide set of principles that we apply in different ways in our um, operating units. There are five main principles addressing the concerns I mentioned earlier around transparency, accountability, bias, uh, and privacy. Number one is we consider the real-world impact of our solutions on people. Two, we take action to prevent the creation or reinforcement of our fair bias. Three, we can explain how our solutions work. Four, we create accountability through human oversight. And five, we respect privacy and champion robust data governance. How these principles have been implemented varies by the segment in which we operate. At Elsevier, we've taken both a top-down and a bottom-up approach. Um, we have a responsible AI team whose role it is to act to review our algorithms and tools um, and, uh, and identify if anything um, may contain bias and requires for the work. We've set up an AI ethics board with stakeholders across the business, and we have different guilds and practitioner groups in data science. And I would like to finish, I think I have still a couple of minutes, with one example of an AI bias issue that I've uh, been involved with in recent months. So our responsible AI team that I just mentioned raised a concern um, about an, an AI tool, which we call the Review and Recommender. This tool helps our journal reviewers, edit, uh, Elsevier is also a large publisher, we have a, a large journal portfolio. The role of editors is to review <coughs> article submissions from authors with the help of peer reviewers. Every article needs to be reviewed by two or three experts, um, and it's very difficult to find them. They need to be to have very deep expertise in the area of the medical or scientific research. And just to give you a sense of scale, last year we had more than two and a half million article submissions. Each one needs to be reviewed by two or three people, and usually you need to approach at least ten. So tens of millions of people. Classic. Um, case for an AI tool, right? Because we have a database called Scopeless with all the articles published, and you could interrogate this data set to find the exact people with the expertise you need. Great. So we developed these tools. Editors have started using it and told us how, how, how much it made their life better, 
really solved the big pain point. But then when we looked at the results of the tool recommendations versus just editor choices left to their own devices, we found that the tool amplifies bias. And it amplifies bias because when you have underrepresented groups in the data set, um, you end up with underrepresented recommendations. And this, we saw, you know, our analysis showed that it impacted the representation of women, of researchers from Global South, and um, early or mid-career researchers. All our groups that, you know, we, and, and it did more than just keep the bias, it amplified it. Why? Because when you're an editor and you have your list of 10 and you see that it's not diverse, you balance it, right? It's, it's, it's what most of our people are interested in. So, um, so we had to fix it. Um, we took actually this issue to our external IND board to seek their advice. We put a disclaimer to let people know this is happening and we're fixing it. We asked editors to fix it themselves while we're working on it. Um, and we've actually used AI to build fair re-ranking into the tool. Um, we're now rolling it out and we've incorporated the bias assessment at every stage of the process now to ensure that this so, um, with the governance we created, we continue to audit and monitor our AI tools and algorithms across our company to ensure that we use AI responsibly. That is the end of my testimony. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much. That was perfectly 10 minutes. Also, oh, wow. Wow. And that's why I should note that as our first witness of the whole day. Setting the bar. That was, that was perfect because we've done a number of these hearings. It's very hard to stay on time. So thank you very much. And, and one of the reasons that's important is because we have this very distinguished panel of experts and the Q&A is frequently really, really important. So leaving time for the Q&A is super important. Thank you so much. Next, we'll hear from Rupak Ghos. I'm hoping I pronounced that Perfect. close to properly. Perfect 100% uh, accuracy. The next eight to 10 minutes are yours. Okay. <laughs> No pressure. Uh, well, thank you to the Chamber of Commerce for inviting me today. Uh, who am I? Um, I've got 20 years experience in financial services. I've worked at large exchange groups, large investment banks, um, and financial market infrastructure firms and fintechs. Uh, I, I recently led a one-year review of AI for a Bank of England-backed industry body, working with some of the biggest banks, both in the front office and the middle office, at the Alan Turing Institute, regulators in the UK, and so forth. Today, I work in fintech land. I work for a smart analytics company called Galatix. Uh, we're 140 professionals, but virtually all of them are data engineers, data scientists, and technologists. Um, one of the products I lead is a product called the Early Warning Signals product. And we're a data analytics and software company, but we scan hundreds of documents, public and private, and we look for signals of corporate and credit distress. Um, there's three real major points I want to discuss with you. Tell you a little bit about how I see AI in financial services, given my wide experience in different segments of the industry. Secondly, uh, and I, coming at it from a financier, economist background, I always think about AI versus humans. When is AI better than humans? When is it worse? Because it's always got to be better. It's got to add value to us. The third, and probably most difficult, is AI policy. Uh, and I'll refer to some financial services stories and some scarce, scarce stories from the financial crisis. Uh, about what we got right in financial services, what we didn't, what does that mean for AI? So let me start with uh, AI and how advanced it is. It is still very, very embryonic in financial services. Financial services needs AI. Now, this is an industry that has a lot of technology. It's not, a tech, it's not the tech sector. But many banks a year, as you'll hear, telling you, telling you we've got thousands of software engineers, we're a tech company. But there's lots and lots of legacy, legacy tech. There's lots and lots of manual data processes, compliance, regulation, post financial crisis, that just increased that massively. At Galatix, we solved a lot of that. But if I look at my work, I did work for Bank of England and the industry a couple of years ago on this. There's a variety of other areas, particularly infrastructure functions. I'll give you examples like financial market surveillance, anti-money laundering, very, very manual processes. Regulations and requirements have gone up massively. Technology can make a difference. Software is used in many of these areas, but rules-based algos often throw up lots and lots of false positives. That's a big, big issue. The second point I'd like to highlight uh, linked technical debt in the banking sector is really AI versus China. Now, as we talk about Western democracies coordinating globally, uh, financial services, I think more than any other industry, China is ahead on AI. You know, we've read all about the, the, the political backlash around the, you know, there's obviously nuances of privacy and so forth, but they are way, way ahead in terms of mass consumption of AI in the financial services sector. Forget the fintech sector, but this is mass consumption of AI. Uh, you know, if I look at the banking sector, 
where AI is probably and technology is probably used most is my old stomping ground, the trading floor. When I started in the, in the sort of mid late nineties, I used to walk on a trading floor, hundreds of guys shouting prices down the phone. That's all automated. It's all quant, but it's still very, very dominated by rules-based algorithms. AI is used in a piecemeal fashion. Banks are very, very careful with giving fines, giving regulation, giving everything that's happened about using AI. So let's not exaggerate how far AI has gone within financial services, which sort of brings me to where Galactic fits, which is the fintech sector. Uh, and I guess my, for my two pence, I would say the fintech sector's worked. It's worked within Western democracies. It's worked in the US, it's worked in Europe. Let's encourage that. Let's, and the fintech sector has been core to AI. Whether that's, and we can talk about in the Q&A about data, you know, in the financial services, we talk about uh, trade reporting data, we talk about open source software, lots and lots of things we can talk about later. But let's encourage the fintech sector. At Galantix, our core product is we digitize processes. We take data. We discover lots of data. It's hundreds and hundreds of data sources. We ingest data, structured, unstructured data. It could be annual reports from the SEC that are thousands of pages long. And then we analyze it. There are many, you know, our customers say that they say 30, 40% of their costs, lots of manual processes are being automated uh, there. Similarly, there are lots and lots of hundreds of B2B and B2C companies doing it. We're not unique. Uh, let's really protect the AI, uh, the fintech sector. So that's really where AI is in financial services, or at least where I see it. Uh, which brings me to my next point about AI. And I'll relate to the model risk because it's an area I've worked with, with lots and lots of senior members of large banks over the last couple of years when I was in an industry standard body. And I always think very simplistically as an economist or a financier, an AI model has to be better than humans. Where can it add value? Uh, and you know, this is a really, really complex and multidimensional topic, but in financial services, it's not unique, unique to financial services, but whether you're a trader, you're a portfolio manager, a hedge fund, or an asset manager, or a banker, you know, you wake up, there are some lines that we sort of used to all our career. One is past performance is no predictor of the future. Relevant, very, very relevant here, but that's the sort of holy grail that we talk about in financial services. The second is the discussion of causation versus correlation. You know, in the manual world that I grew up in, we used to sit, sit at the desk and discuss that all the time. Obviously, you know, there's relevance to that. The third is really thinking out of the box. I recently wrote a piece for the Financial Times about this, and I narrated the story of Abraham Walt, the Hungarian World War II professor, and planes coming back from war. And I can talk about that later, but it's really about looking for black swans. Don't just look for the bullet holes. Look for where the bullet holes haven't gone. So my overall point is that you know model risk has to be and regulation has to be so flexible and allow humans in the loop. The extent to which AI models uh, are superior to human models at the moment. Which brings me to a couple of examples I would like to highlight around model relevance um, and use cases. So when I did this study with the Bank of England and worked with some very very experienced data scientists across large banks and asset managers and so forth, we were looking for the you, know, you read about good AI, bad AI, evil actors, conspiracy theory, and so forth. The conclusion was actually about model relevance. Now, is that model relevance for this action? You know, the primary area, because I was looking at financial markets, was algo trading, both on the buy side and the sell side, other rumors. And a rules based algo has been around for 20, 30 years and you know, try even guess and pee every day and so forth. But you know, how is AI you know, can affect that? And really, it's really, you know, what's the business case? Uh, what part of the firm is it being used in and is it relevant at that time? And that sort of model relevance we found was an overwhelming driver, despite all the scare stories you read about. You've you know, read about credit scoring and all these things. And I'm not saying there's not evil AI out there, but model relevance was, particularly in financial services, where it's very nuanced. You know, an algo model on a trading desk is very nuanced. It's very, the component parts are very different to an algo somewhere else. Uh, which brings me to a story about Galactics, really, and use cases. You know, one of the things we always talk about is data accuracy and model accuracy. But I was talking to our chief data engineer, Galtix, about this on the weekend. I said, I'm a distinguished panel I'm presenting to. And he's like, well, it depends on what, what are you trying to get. You know, Galtix are a product of digitizing manual processes. So hundreds of documents, thousands of documents, and digitizing that. Humans are pretty good at that. Humans are pretty good at reading an annual report, copying it, building Excel spreadsheets, and so forth. But they're not good at doing it at scale and speed. So we have to give our bank clients and our sophisticated insurance clients the scale of the human accuracy, which may be 100% and me 100%, humans are 100% accurate, obviously. But we also have to give them that scale and speed. I was speaking to a friend of mine who runs a, a very large hedge fund about this, uh, about coming here the weekend. He's like, well, I don't need to give 100% accuracy. My AI programs need to be better than the other guy more than half the time. 
some of the best fund managers in the world are right slightly more than 50% of the time. So it really goes back to use cases, so model relevance and use cases. What are you using for it? Um, and, and, and really transparency around that. The other thing that's really, I think, specific, specific to financial services, but I think very, very relevant in financial services, it's a marketplace. So I grew up in financial markets on the trading floor, speaking to the buy side, and financial markets are a marketplace. But even in, in other areas like corporate banking, you've got a lender, you've got a borrower, a securitization, generally they're marketplace. And you've got interplay between agents, some good and bad. You've had bad agents in financial services since the beginning of history. They've been humans and you've read about all the rules-based algos, they go crazy and, and all the things that happen there. But the complexity of AI and AI models and the interplay of AI models, that's a field area, and I did a lot of work with Turing Institute on this, I just feel hasn't been researched enough. There's a sort of model risk within that specific vertical that's looked at, but how do the models play together and game theory and so forth? And that can be directly, but it can be indirectly. As a recent member of Twitter, I've seen Elon Musk move markets with the size of a, with a tweet. Very few people have the scale of Elon Musk, but AI bots do. Just think about AI bots on Twitter manipulating social media. I, I watch all the congressional testimony to politics and culture and social media companies. Just think about financial markets that I grew up on and social media and what AI bots can do, you know, whether it's collusion together on social media and at the same time on a central middle order book or on an RFQ platform, and I can go into that detail later. But I think that interplay to AI models, uh, I feel, is sometimes underplayed, uh, at least in my humble opinion. So what does this all mean for AI policy? We obviously want to make the world more productive. But again, I come back to being a financier and an economist by background and thinking about improving productivity. You know, the, uh, and I'll give, give you some humble pie. You know, we all want let, less, we, we don't, no one wants too much red tape. We all want a look, regulation that looks forward. We don't want too much regulated arbitrage. We all want a level playing field and we all want it to be policed properly. But that's all obvious, obvious to everyone, I think, in this room. It all sounds simple, but it's very, very complex. I'll just give some stories from my financial services experience, rather than AI experience, to sort of couch that as you guys think about, uh, and this is the story kind of, kind of thinks about AI guidelines. And I'd start really with uh, looking forward. A lot of the financial services regulation coming out of the US and Europe, post-financial crisis, looked in the back, in, in the rear window. That's all good and well, and some of it was fantastic. I'm not going to debate, you know, we can debate that later, but really look forward. Uh, one area that I, I focused a lot on with the work I did on model risk was model risk in banks. So there was a seminal piece of model risk work by the, done by the New York Fed in 2010, I think, SI 11 It looked at liquidity, it looked at capital, it looked at, that's 12 years old now. And the New York Fed guidance drives the world, because the, New, well, the Fed thinks, the Fed and the ECB basically drive you know, Western democracies regulation. You know, do we have moral risk guidance ready that's forward looking? Which leads me on to how much regulation is needed. I'm just going to ask you to take 60 seconds to wrap up. Okay. How much regulation is needed? We've all seen the EU regulation. We've all seen, you know, it's all good having a pilot's license and so forth. But as someone from the commercial side of the class, I, I, I do think there's a balance between rules and having standards. And transparency, I think, is a key thing. Particularly, I mean, we speak to very sophisticated B2B clients. When you think about B2C consumers, and I see it every day with the crypto world, what happens with stable coins and what happens with crypto today and ESG, real focus on transparency. And that's where I believe the US Chamber of Commerce is a unique institution. And Jamie Diamond talks about the regulatory arbitrage, the graphic arbitrage, the arbitrage between private and public. The US Chamber of Commerce, as a segment that goes across that segment, can create those, those guidelines I can talk about later. Uh, I was going to talk about Reg R, but I'll, I'll, I'll skip over that. Uh, and I re my final point I really wanted to make was rules are only as good as the cops that we have that implement those rules. You know, what do I mean that? This fantastic economist at central banks, this fantastic lawyers at securities lawyers, regulation. They did a fantastic job on financial crisis. They're all trying to get tech savvy. They're all hanging out with, with the smartest academics in AI. But oh, have they seen the real world? And what do I mean by the real world? The SEC has whistleblowers. Some of the best risk managers and best compliance officers in the second line of defense and financial institutions are actually former traders. It's the movie Catch Me If I Can. Has anyone seen that? Mm -hmm. Leonardo DiCaprio, he's a, he's a fraudster, and then he works for the FBI. Uh, and you know, the sort of last question I sort of leave this distinguished panel with is, do you have the right people in place at the, internet, in the private sector and the government to police this? Because that's really important. Thank you very much. I know you were talking super fast, and appreciate that. You got a lot in, so thank you. And we'll hopefully get to revisit some of those uh, points and the questions.
Um, next is Kenneth uh, Cook here. Did I say that? Close enough. Close enough. Yeah. Cookier. Yeah. Okay. That's in French. It is. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, Kenneth is the Deputy Executive Director and host of Babbage Podcast at The Economist. So it's yours. Great. Thank you very much. Um, honored to be here. Honored to come after two fascinating um, fellow panelists uh, discussing uh, this incredibly interesting and important issue. So, as noted, I'm the deputy executive editor of The Economist. I've written some books on data and artificial intelligence. I'm also a board director of Chatham House, which is the Royal Institute for International Affairs. This seems to give me a lot of credibility in the charity classes of Britain. But you might tell from my accent I'm not British, but I'm American. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, let me start with just uh, to set the, the context very briefly. It's two very basic points, and the first one is about centrism. Uh, we're in a world of polarization. We're seeing it everywhere. We're pulling apart, whether it's economic, whether it's certainly social, culture wars. Uh, and what we're missing is the reasonable middle. And so I embrace what the U.S. Chamber of Commerce is doing because for decades, you've been the voice of centrism, and uh, my perspectives are going to try to bring together a world of polarization. Uh, to one in which you can try to find some common accord, but in some counterintuitive ways. The second point is about the importance of exponential technologies. We sort of think we know what exponentials are, we use the term all, all the time. In fact, it was mentioned in the opening remarks. But I just want to focus our mind on what it means in terms of the speed. Um, if I was to take 30 paces, each pace was a meter long, after 30 paces, I would be 30 meters away. But if my paces were exponential, one, and then two, and then four, and then eight, after 30 paces, I would have gone to the moon and back. Okay. So in a world of exponential technologies, things are happening a lot faster than we can imagine. And of course, that's happening with AI as well. And then thirdly, AI is a general purpose technology. It's not, and I think it's pretty obvious, it's not just simply one technology that goes into one domain, but like printing or electricity or computing themselves. It's going to be the platform for all other subsequent innovations. So it's so incredibly important that we get it right. So the three areas of AI, almost curses that we have to deal with, uh, are explainability, privacy, and inequality. And let me explain what I mean by each dimension, because I think it can actually shift into a way that is either surprising or uncomfortable, not obvious. Explainability, as was said earlier, um, uh, actually, by both uh, panelists, um, the models that we get uh, don't give us give us a correlation. They don't give us causation, and it's hard to define some form of reason to how it arrived at an outcome. The result is going to be that there's going to be at the higher end of AI algorithms some degree of fuzz in which we have to trust the algorithm rather than the decision that a human being would choose to do. In fact. When it comes to detecting diseases through um, the retina scan, when you validate the, the performance of an algorithm by human ophthalmologists, the performance of the algorithm goes down because the AI system can identify things that the human ophthalmologist cannot. So what do we do as a society if we have an algorithm that in certain domains, because you can test it against ground truth, you can find out is it disease here or not, predictably find out later if that's the case or not, but at the time the diagnosis happens, the ophthalmologist doesn't see it because it's not apparent to the human eye, it is to artificial intelligence. Do we accept that we're going to actually only trust things that we have a reasoned answer to and that we can run the experiment again and get the same output? Or are we going to accept that there's at the higher performance some degree of fuzz in which where it's blurred and where we can't know for certain, but we have to put some trust into it that it's going to work better than the alternatives. But I think a wise society is one in which we trust the mathematics and the statistics and the system, rather than sort of try to bring it back down to what is cognitively acceptable to the human, but still will not be as good as if we trusted the machine. I can talk more about that in the Q&A. The second example is privacy. We all understand that there's a value to intimacy and to privacy. However, 
The way that artificial intelligence systems work and work very well is it needs all of the data, all of the quote unquote raw data. Full disclosure, there's no such thing as raw data, it's not completely raw. There's a human being who had to bother to collect it, it's collected in a certain form and not another. But the point is that it is as almost uncurated by the touch of a human as possible. What does it actually mean in practice? Well, if I was to come up with a well, top five. Uh, there is a researcher at the University of Michigan who has come up with an algorithm to determine the hospital readmission rates as well as septus, likely of getting uh, infection in a hospital. And if you look at the, at, at the ways in which you would define causality and come up with a model of maybe 15 different features, it would be 75% accurate. But if you take all of the information, 10,000 data points, including the billing record, you'll actually get it like 95%. Maybe it's 8 percent It could be considerably better. But why would that be the case? Well, I can answer that. We can sort of, our mind can actually reach to a causal conclusion that's a viable one, which is the billing record would include the, the issuer of the credit card. And we also know that some credit card issuers go to low income families rather than to higher income families. So, in fact, there's a third variable here that we're identifying, which is economic um, well being of the person, of the patient. And there's, you know, we all know from that, that class is a great determinant on health outcomes. The point here is that that is comprehensible. We know that, right? But of course, if you have 10,000 variables, there's a lot of other things that we didn't know about, a lot of causal connections that we didn't have. But you would not have known, you wouldn't have had an as good a accurate algorithm to predict the likelihood of possible readmissions or septis if you didn't use those 10,000 data points, including ones that people think to be incredibly personal and therefore maybe they're uncomfortable with. How do we square the circle? Well, there is a potential way. By understanding there's a difference between input privacy and output privacy. The input privacy is the data that goes into the model, the output privacy is how the data is used. Think of it as an example in the terminology of law, collection and use. Often in, in privacy law, we're, we're, we're regulating the collection of the data because it's easier to do. There's sort of a low chi around it. Slap someone on the fingers if there's something wrong. But on the use, it's a little bit trickier. How do you define it in the law? There's going to be, it'll also forestall innovation. We can see how that might play out in practice when you think in terms of all of the photographs that are on social media that are inherently publicly accessible. In some ways, we sort of like that, we want to keep that. But at the same time, there's Clearview AI, which is using our photographs and in ways that we probably are uncomfortable with. If you don't know anything, talk about the Q&A, but it's used by law enforcement to, it basically is a record of almost the face, well, the face print of almost everyone, everyone on Earth, everyone certainly on the, on the internet. And so in ways that we might feel uncomfortable with, and maybe we should regulate that as an output privacy feature, but not the input privacy, or if you will, regulate the use, not the collection. The third point is inequality. Uh, here, uh, it is difficult for a lot of people who've grown up and seen the huge evolution of computers to reframe how they imagine artificial intelligence. Because the story of technology, and most technologies for the last several centuries, has been this democratizing force, right? We remember that, you know, a large computer was something that you walked into, and then you have a supercomputer in your phone all the time, because the price decreased and it flourished. You know, poor people have Supercomputers in their pockets, who would have imagined 50 years ago? The problem with AI is it seems, at least so far today, to be very hierarchical and not democratizing, but actually requiring increasing levels of scale and resources to be extremely good at it. And so that forces us to rethink how we imagine uh, interacting with AI, regulating it, using it to flourish for, for human betterment. The first area of going to, is going to be in corporate concentration. We're already seeing that with Meta and Google and DeepMind versus the West. We're seeing that in terms of the 20th century development model of economies, poor countries versus rich countries, and how that they interact, and whether poor countries using this manufacturing development model to move up into the world of economic enfranchisement might be forestalled from that. Thirdly, we're seeing that in terms of automation, what it means for workers. That's possibly how we think of inequality. And lastly, in terms of what we'll call the best versus the rest. Those companies that have adopted AI are outperforming, not by like 10 or 20 or 30%, but by five times, 10 times, 20 times the baseline in their industry. So do we pull down the winners? 
Probably not. That would be, I think, out of what a wise society would do. What we would do is let the winners flourish, but help the people, not the firms. I think public policy should focus on that. Uh, I know I'm probably out of time. Let me make one final remark on what is probably going to be the biggest elephant in the room that no one's want to talk about. May I do that? Yeah. Great. Let's go. Buckle up. So the great set, the, the great sanction. Actually, we're to use. Yes, I have to come back. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So what is the great sanction that we should do? How do we clobber over the head the companies that we think for some reason, maybe because they're just great being successful, or maybe they're doing something wrong? We'll see. Uh, how do we sanction them in the world of AI? Well, there, there's this really alluring idea. We'll take away their data, right? We'll force some form of sort of disclosure of their data or data portability. This really worries me on many grounds. Okay, so the first one is let's just play this in, in sort of practical steps. If we think Amazon is too big and we want to share my buying patterns with another online bookstore, it is completely blind to the fact that I might be sharing my buying patterns of books which are into it myself with Amazon because I trust Amazon. So I absolutely would not want that data shared with Baidu or someone else. And if it is Baidu, which is Chinese, and I'm reading books about how to overthrow a government, maybe I'll, because I'm a high, you know, a, a vitriolic capitalist and I wouldn't want to have a communist government, I'd be very wary of sharing that data with first a third, a different company, but secondly a different company in a different country or a different company that has different values. That's just one example. The second thing, maybe more important, is collecting data is hard. It's not the same data. Amazon's really smart because not because you went to a, to a web page, because they know that the better signal is that you maybe stayed on the web page from this time, or that you revisited the web page, or that your mouse moved in some sort of fashion versus another that predicted that you were intrigued in the page versus just sort of leaving the computer while you were making something at dinner. Really smart companies are investing in the data so that they choose the right signals. If they have to sort of disgorge the data, first it's going to be meaningless if it's just some sort of blanket generic data. But secondly, if it's going to be really valuable data, it shouldn't be disgorged. They, through trial and error, invested to collect really good data to know what was, what was relevant and what wasn't. So although we may need to sanction large companies if they run afoul of our values and our law, I'd be really wary of reaching for what I think is a very facile, mentally facile solution, which is to ask them to, to disgorge their data into some sort of comments. That to me is, is quite unthoughtful as a solution. Uh, the final conclusion is that, um, that if you see how this is going to play out, we're going to have a spheres of influence of AI similar to how we've had in international relations. And we're going to have a Western flavor of AI with the Western values. It's going to make the battles between America and Europe over GDPR seem like, like a small trifle because our more, our, we're, there's so much more that brings us together than separates us. Versus authoritarian countries, China, Russia, many others, and their flavor of AI. And it's going to be a battle that's going to be quasi neo-colonial because it's going to be played out in out overseas markets like Latin America, Asia, and Africa. So the stakes are really high. And I think the US Chamber of Commerce has a great role to ensure that uh, Western values are part of the AI conversation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Great panel. Thank you all. I'm going to give the first question to Congressman Billing. Really great panel. Thank you. Uh, so, so you teed up. Um, at the end there, some very interesting topics. So uh, I'll start there. And first of all, I'm a big admirer of the publication. <clears throat> so how would you sanction them? Should we decide to sanction them? Uh, because data disgorgement doesn't, in, in your mind, uh, doesn't seem practical. That seems to be a correct line of thinking, actually. Um, that's my first question. And my second question is, how do you think if you view the if you view the battle between the United States and Europe or say China and Russia, but really China, with our advantage being only the great innovators can thrive in a liberal democracy, and their advantage being that they have no 
privacy limitations and therefore can use their whole country as a giant database uh, to advance their technologies, who's got a better hand to play? So two questions, how would you sanction them and who's got a better hand to play in your judgment? I, I may not have framed the last question. No, no, those, right. those, are, those, are, those are great, great questions. Um, I, would, I would be really foolish if I, if I said I had the answers to them. I don't. I'm working them out, right? So, it took, it took so you just posed the question. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. It, took, it, it takes a long time for the issue to be right sure. enough that I can I sort of crystallize it in the way that we expressed it. Now that we're sort of thinking about it in this way, let's first remember that um, just because you can use your whole America can use the whole country as a great big database as well. There's very little privacy law that right. prevents that from happening. Yes, against minors and healthcare, is a good but otherwise, there's a lot of credit bureaus as well, and the federal government is a great consumer of the data from the credit bureaus. So, um, so I'm not so worried about that. The you, you do have an advantage in the consumer internet space for AI companies like Ant Financial to offer financial services in a way that American fintech companies or American banks have not been able to do, or just because they haven't gotten their act together. They probably could do it with the just those terms and conditions um, if they wanted to, and they eventually will. So I, I think that the bigger stakes to focus on is really about the misuse of data. Keep in mind, the final point is that China has a fairly good a privacy, set of privacy rules that govern the use of data visibly the consumer and the company, but it still gives the country complete access rights to it. But then again, America has largely the same access rights as well. We have a layer of, um, of legal protection around that FISA courts, etc. how it's used, but it still gives national security interest to have it. So I think that that's a little bit of a, of a shimmer up. It's not realistic. The, so me, I'll, I'll leave it at that to say that the advantage that China has versus America and Europe is more ephemeral, although European privacy law is definitely going to hobble European players, and because it has a long run of law effect, it's going to hobble American suits. Um, let's go for, does do liberal democracies lead to innovation? Because you get uh, sort of a liberalism or liberty uh, intellectually as a consumer as well as a citizen in terms of free choice in your politics and free choice in your, your, in your economy, that therefore leads to a form of liberalism and a freedom of thought that is more innovative in, uh, in, in technology, in the sciences, and in business. That has been what we've been telling ourselves for 200 years as a country. It's probably not true. I think it, I think it actually, it, it's, it's, it's somewhat true around the edges, I think at the higher advances of science, when you have a single authority and you have a system that is geared towards respecting that single authority, China, versus you have authority known as science and you have a system that is inherently adversarial to authority, the Western liberal tradition, I do think that actually I sort of will, will still put my money on liberalism for innovation. But for the here and now in terms of pragmatic, practical products, I wouldn't rely simply on the liberal democratic ethos being more innovative. Okay. So, so when we do that, I call it. I do want to get to a couple more yeah. questions. Yeah. Um, that, I think I've filibustered long enough that I no. don't know how to section it. <laughs> 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 no. We're going to try to do two, two more you. questions on this panel. I'm going to try to spread them out a little bit. So when you go, just introduce yourself briefly. Yeah. Uh, I'm Adam Thier. I'm at George Mason University. Uh, so all three of you had something to say about explainability and transparency. And the abstract is possible to be against uh, these things, but everyone loves them. But can you tell us a little bit more about concretely how they should translate into policy restrictions? Because two, two questions here. Really, first of all, kind of making the point about how there is there's some degree of fuzz surrounding a lot of the models that we're talking about, an inherent ambiguity or a, a an ability to understand exactly how everything works in them. How does that translate if we have a mandate for explainability or transparency of these models? Secondly, how and when will mandatory AI explainability or transparency come into conflict with other values we care about? Use privacy, system security, intellectual property, and so on. Yeah, uh, that's a it's a long question. Um, I mean, 
I think it comes back to risk for me, explainability. You know, where there's a balance sheet, you know, I think about financial services, where there's a balance sheet, it's automatically using, using AI, but the explainability level has to be different and has to be explainable who to, a regulator, does it? You know, where, where it's analytics provided, for example, and you don't have to action that and there's a human in the loop, the explainability doesn't have to be that as high. So I think it, it varies depending on the, on, on the use case massively. I don't, I'm not a, a AI academic, but I don't, I don't, I don't think there's, I don't think there's a golden, the golden answer. We've been looking for this golden answer, and I've read thousands of papers about this. There, is, there just isn't one. I do think with the broad consumer, there is something like transparency, and that transparency, it's not going to be a rigid formula. And I've, I've, I've read with, I've dealt with Dodd Frank and all the financial services regulation we dealt with. And there's always a loophole, and there's always, and it, it goes back to I think flexibility uh, within that. Um, and I go back to this story I narrated about the sort of Abraham Ward story. You know, just, just thinking, I think if you, if, you, if you go back to rigid formula, what financial services taught me is that there's always a loophole somewhere. Um. So I would, I would just add and say, I agree, it varies by the reason you deploy this AI. And to some degree, you can always explain how it works. But then, depending on the area, um, you have to think about fraud protection. Right. So how deep do you go? That's that's really the varies. Hi, I'm Shabat. I will call myself a researcher because I have most applications. Um, the question I have is maybe primarily for pose. Um, can you maybe extemporize, extemporaneously talk about how maybe AI yeah, might be relevant or useful for security markets, financial markets? Have you and you, you talked you said about you said AI yeah, is going to be useful. In, in fintech, as we really think about it, really useful like sizing data. But the comment you made about uh, uh, game theory and the application of AI when you have multiple AIs in play, I've been thinking about it before, and I'm wondering if there's a way to sort of formalize that thing and think about how we can use AI models to think about how things are Yeah, so I think it goes back to, again, at least simplistic, I think about it is you know, where is AI better than humans, or where can it add value to humans? Um, when I look at what we do at Galatics, the core product, not the early warning signal product, but the digitization product, you know, a, a lot of that humans have high accuracy, but you know, AI adds value there. Similarly, in uh, you know, a lot of infrastructure functions in the financial services, like in anti money laundering, for example, and um, financial market surveillance, rules based algos, because they've picked up you know, buzzwords and so forth, and I can talk about it at length, but they just haven't worked. You know, there's, I, remember I wrote a big paper about this false positive, so it's just you know, out, of, out of this world. Uh, and lots of different chance of lawyers being hired as a result. But you know, they're, 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 AI, a self-learning program, has. there's been evidence that self-learning has worked out. So I've been in some of those labs where self-learning, it's still very, very early um, in both of those areas. But I can see it's, it's an area where rules-based algorithms don't work. So can AI work is, is my point. Which goes back to your, uh, I, the, the final point about the, um, the game theory angle. Uh, I just feel it's somewhere where we need to study, and I haven't seen it studied. Uh, I remember two years ago when I started working at the Bank of England, sat, sat in, in, in the Bank of England, and, and a professor from Oxford, I think, was talking about it. And they, they'd run game theory on an EU basis. It was looking at manufacturing products. Not, nothing to do with it. Uh, and they found that actors worked. It was almost like, you think about financial services, instant chat groups and Bloomberg and road traders and poker games and all that. And the, the algos have worked out how to work to do that. Uh, I haven't seen as much that much academic research there that the, the man on the street <laughs> can read. So um, highlighting yeah, you know, actually lab work on that. You know, um, yeah. it, it, some, something in a lab is fine, but take it out and try mm -hmm. see, see it in the real world. Interact with social media, and I think about it every every day as we see anything on must tweet tweet. You know, you've got all these, all these AI, all the bots, and all that going on at the moment. Now, the, the sort of interplay of that, because, you know, from a financial services perspective, you know, what is bad stuff? It's, you know, we always say there's market abuse, which is illegal trading and all that, and there's market stability. You know? uh, and I think about it particularly from a market stability perspective. You know, in China, the Chinese government just steps in, the home team steps in and does whatever they want to do, whatever. But I, I think about that further down the track, because if it's, you know, it, it can scale really quickly. We've seen it in rules-based algos, and we've seen it with the flash crashes and stuff like that. And, and we've seen how financial markets is sort of the, the, the tail drag, the tail dragging the dog in the sense that you know the financial markets drive the real economy. Sorry, sorry, can I just sorry. add a little bit of um, clarification there? Um, is you talk about a flash crash, and people, some people talk about it being the, 
we talk about maybe being a digital product or maybe a technical product. Um, I, in the market you're working with, or you've, you've had exposure to, you have situations where you have more AI box essentially working working in the market, maybe potentially instead of like the market. Is that, is that no, it, ha it hasn't. And again, the markets vary. You know, I grew up in cash equities, highly liquid. Uh, worked in exchange groups like CME Group, highly liquid. Uh, now I deal with corporate loans and insurance. It's a, you know, across the liquidity spectrum, but there isn't AI bots stabilizing. Um, maybe that's the that's the, that's the sort of utopia in China, the Chinese government's dream. You know, instead of just the home team coming in and buying the market when it's down, you know, the AI bots manage the market. Uh, Sorry. Thank you. This has been a fabulous panel. Thank you all very much. Great way to kick off our hearing today. Uh, Congressman Delaney is going to take us through the next panel. Great. Is that okay? Yeah, that's yeah. it. Who's the, you're the CEO and co-founder of Predictive Black. Thanks for joining us. Thank so you if you would give us some seven minutes of remarks and then we'll get Philip uh, volume up and we'll keep moving. Thank okay. you. Okay. So unlike the previous panel, I'm going to bring you guys into the nitty gritty reality of what it's like to be a small business owner. So I am a small business owner and my entire client base are small business owners. So I spend all of my working life talking to people who are basically not really techno obje objectives, but they're not really kind of in the adoption space either. So I think about SMBs with their survival first mentality. They're really just looking to what can technology do for me to help me to keep my business in business, growing, thriving, whatever that looks like for them. So I encounter on a daily basis challenges. My business is an AI-based cash management tool. If I start by saying my business work uses artificial intelligence to help forecast your cash flow better, I almost literally can feel and go, well, I don't trust that. Thank you very much. How are you better than my Excel spreadsheet? You're not. Also, you have no context about my world. Actually, my software does have context. But what I learned from when I very first, on my very first client meeting, which was disastrous, disastrous, because I went in, hooray, look what we built. It's clever. It's got all this clever stuff. I have no idea why, but it's brilliant. And literally, hang up. I mean, I could not have had a worse encounter. It was the most soul-destroying moment because we spent two years building this thing and I was super excited by it. So what I've reflected on is the reality of the world that my clients live in and my own world. And I go through this loop of they're aware of artificial intelligence. And what are they aware of? They're aware of self-driving cars, which crash and kill the test trust dummies. I mean, whatever they think. This is their... their framework. Maybe chatbots, some are good, some are bad. Today, obviously, in the UK, we've got the Google story with, you know, Blake Lemoyne's test. So that will kill my week now because all I'll get in client meetings is, hmm, is your AI clever? Is it literally sent to you? What should I worry about? <laughs> no, it's not, you know. So, so all these things, they've got this basic level of awareness. Then they've got an attitude. And when, by attitude, I mean negative. So I get trust issues thrown at me a lot. Your, my, my Excel spreadsheet is very clever, and I control it, and I control the cell data. I mean, this is sophisticated CFOs and finance directors. I'm not talking to non-clever people, non-smart people. But they still have this trust issue. So their attitude towards it is, yeah, but it's not really that clever, is it? If I can get through that to some form of acceptance, I honestly want to crack open the gin at that point, but I don't. I wait, I wait, I wait. Because then I've got to sell the application of the software. How will it do better for their business than them and their Excel spreadsheet? What is it it can give them? And occasionally I run into situations where they say, well, it'll get so smart, you know, that actually it'll start running the world. And, you know, the challenge is that actually the machines are not smart enough to run the world, and that's a good thing. And we have to worry about bias and, you know, inbuilt bias and what we build. So there's a bit of reassurance for them. No, it's not going to put you out of a job, and still miss CFO. You know, it's not going to do that. Then I've got to take them through this adoption journey where they throw all sorts of other reasons that, that they shouldn't be adopted at me. And assuming I get there, I reach this pinnacle 
this sort of hierarchy, it's my own version of Maslow, this hierarchy where they become advocates for what we've done. I mean, I've got so few of those that I can't even, I mean, I could probably count them, bring them in and say hi to them. Because it's a really, really long process in general. And what I'm working against is the inherent bias <coughs> against artificial intelligence, which actually all of the highfalutin tech stories don't help me with, in a sense. So all of the great things it can do cause me problems because I then find myself talking to people who don't understand it, they've got a basic awareness and their attitude is, it's not going to be great for me. So I have this kind of recurring challenge. So if I think about, you know, what do I think is the opportunity, I break down my world into my reality, working with my clients, what are the possibilities for them more broadly, and how ready are they to accept? And I think those three buckets, you know, the, the reality of their world and that comprehension, the possibilities not just from my product but from other products, but then how? How do they do it? And for an SMB, you know, the UK, very similar to the US, 99.9% .9 of our turnover comes from SMBs. You know, yes, our, our absolute volumes are smaller, you know, you've got 61 million, we've got 5.58 or whatever. So, you know, we have very similar dynamics within our economies. And I'm talking to these guys on a regular basis. And the reality for them post-pandemic, which is why survival is crucial, is declining revenue, maybe declining client demand, supply chain logistic issues have got more and more challenging. Um, their order book has maybe gone down. Cash flow, you know, thank goodness, cash flow has got more complex. So I feel I can win maybe on some of those conversations more than previously. And demand forecasting is not. So there's so many great tools out there already, and I think if we as a community who serve SMBs can focus on what's in it for them, rather than how clever we are for creating it, and maybe take some of the fear out of it, we will see a lot more development in demand forecasting, process improvement and operational efficiencies are kind of where it's at currently. And I, I got three emails this morning telling me how fabulous these companies could be to you know, make my data more efficient for me. Not brilliant from lead gen research, but you know, fair enough. Um, what I encounter is organizational readiness is a barrier to adoption. So even if I get through awareness and attitude, getting into the practical implementation, how easy is it, before you even get into the issues around trust and transparency and you know, the data understanding where their data so if we get there at all, they'll talk about, I don't have enough people, I can't do a change program right now, it's going to be super expensive, you know, my suppliers aren't ready, um, your business isn't like me, how can it understand me? So we encounter enormous issues all the time. And I think my, my excitement to be invited here to talk to you guys is because it's brilliant to see that you are interested in how we can make that world more accessible and more beneficial to SMBs. So from my perspective, I'd like to turn the focus around and think, not just can we do it because we can do it, how exciting, you know, but can we do it for a good reason and do people need it, want it, will it make their lives better? And I'm going to stop that. <laughs> Your timing was perfect. Phew. Thank you. Philip, I think... Uh... We now have uh, volume for you. Did we lose okay, oh. let's give this a shot. Great, thank you. Sorry about that. Okay, perfect. Hi, everyone. Um, greetings from Brussels in Belgium. Uh, I'm here at NATO headquarters, uh, and I work in the NATO Innovation Unit. Uh, in fact, I've been the acting head of the unit since September. Um, this unit is a strategic policy shop, and our whole purpose uh, and state of being is to look at how uh, the Alliance interacts with what we call emerging and disruptive technologies. Um, these are critical technologies that are vital to what we call our technological edge, which is um, a major component of our deterrence and defensive posture uh, to safeguard the nearly 1 billion citizens across NATO. Um, the focus of these EDTs are really interesting. We have a whole list of particular technologies of, of interest. Uh, AI is one of them. Um, and uh, we are looking in particular at two issues. First of all, how we can foster uh, these particular technologies in all respects, 
Uh, we are looking at how they are developed, how they are being adopted, procurement issues, uh, the general state of, of their characteristics and how they're being uh, produced, uh, and then also uh, protecting them. We are concerned about our adversaries and competitors. We're concerned about the general state of their pace of development and adoption. And we're also very much concerned about how these sorts of technologies uh, might be used against us uh, in this particular domain. The other element that I think is unique about EDTs is that most of these technologies uh, that are cutting edge are not being developed primarily by the government anymore. And so if you think about it, sometime between the mid 90s and the early 2000s, uh, governments and in particular defense and security stopped being the primary driver behind innovation in cutting edge technology um, for a whole host of reasons. And if you look at the list of technologies uh, on our EDT list, AI, quantum, autonomy, biotech, human enhancement, these sorts of things, the vast majority of the spend on this is actually coming from the private sector. And most of these technologies have incredibly broad commercial uses, which is why I'm speaking before the US Chamber of Commerce today and not a group of four-star generals, for example. And so um, because of these particular characteristics that they're no longer funded by the government, and in most cases, most of the development isn't really being driven by defense and security needs, it means that we at NATO need to be much more aware about the wide variety of stakeholders involved in these technologies and the development. Uh, in particular, we focus on entrepreneurs and startup founders. We are looking at the private sector investors and providers of risk capital uh, behind this innovation. Uh, we are looking at large industry, uh, not only traditional defense contractors and primes, uh, but also big tech companies. Um, and then of course, we've got academia and government that have roles to play in this. Um, but when we look at government, I think there's uh, more stakeholders than we have seen uh, traditionally within just the military and the defense and security landscape. Um, I should note that many of these technologies are dual use technologies, but dual use is a concept that we at NATO are now rethinking a little bit. It's no longer the area of Cold War dual use where you have technologies that are developed for military purposes that all also have some sort of a commercial application. Instead, now we're looking at technologies that have very broad commercial applications and also can have a critical impact on defense and security. Um, and that has a significant impact. Um, just touching for a brief second on regulation, um, you can look at, for example, the EU draft regulation for AI that exempts uh, defense and security or military use uh, from the scope of its regulation, which is all fine and, and fair. Uh, but if most AI development is really being driven for commercial purposes, most of the AI actually that we're interested in at a fundamental level um, is actually in scope of the regulation. And so it has a very significant impact. And I think this was touched on by the previous panel when we talked about China, for example, and competition in that uh, strategic threshold. Um, so one of the other elements that I wanted to talk about today uh, was the NATO AI strategy. Um, so I led the development and the agreement of this strategy, uh, which was endorsed by allied defense ministers back in October of last year. Um, at the very core of this strategy are our ethical principles and our commitment uh, to democratic norms and values. And so this strategy has something called principles of responsible use, or actually principles of responsible development uh, and use, uh, because we believe that accelerating responsible innovation is critical to ensure that we're building trust and that we're building accountability uh, in these areas, and that's on the basis of our shared democratic principles. We don't want to have repeats of things like Project Maven with Google, where we have an inability to be able to gain the trust of our society and the trust of our innovators uh, to produce technologies that are really critical. And so we have to be able to demonstrate that we are taking concrete steps and actions uh, to be able to bridge that gap and to demonstrate uh, that we are different, in fact, from um, other uh, adversaries and, and competitors in this space. And so uh, these AI principles are available on the NATO website. If you'd like to look, the strategy itself is a restricted document, uh, but there is a public version uh, that I encourage all of you to take a look at. And so in particular, allies have committed to six principles in AI. And just to go through them, um, they are uh, lawfulness, uh, which is basically uh, noting that we'll develop and use AIs in accordance with these democratic values and in under our commitment to the rule of law. Uh, they are responsibility and accountability. Uh, 
which goes into how we develop and use AI with appropriate levels of judgment and care, that there is a clear human responsibility and accountability to the use of particular AI systems. Uh, explainability and traceability that I think the panel can understand in general, uh, but it goes back to being able to trace how decisions were made or explain how decisions were made uh, and to be able to apply that. Uh, then we have reliability uh, to basically demonstrate that we are taking into account uh, the, the safety, the robustness, the security of these systems to ensure that they can be relied on. Uh, it re requires a significant amount of testing and insurance across the life cycle of AI systems. And then the last two are governability, uh, which goes into uh, uh, intended use versus unintended use, how and when we have human beings in the loop with regards to AI systems. And of course, last but not least, bias mitigation. Um, bias, um, of course, in the sense of things like diversity and looking at how uh, AI considers things such as uh, gender, di uh, um, gender and um, uh, sexuality and sexual orientation and so on and so forth. Um, but also bias in terms of natural biases or biases that might emerge uh, from the use of these systems themselves. So we have these six principles. We have uh, descriptions of them, uh, but these are still at high level. These have been agreed by all 30 allied nations, so they have agreed to commit behind these principles for defense and security. Uh, but now it's time to put these principles into practice, and that is going to take some significant time and various steps. Um, and in that way, NATO is somewhat at the fore, uh, forefront of trying to execute these. Only one other uh, NATO ally in particular had published principles of responsible use for defense and security. That was the United States. Uh, and there is still very much a rolling out effort to try and determine how we can operationalize these principles. That said, we want to build on what we believe are very robust frameworks. Um, and we have these frameworks in defense and security, and we've had them for decades. Uh, and quite a significant amount of experience using them. And these are things like adherence to legal obligations, uh, making use of our advanced testing and evaluation regimes, uh, especially for safety critical systems, and then also looking at risk management systems that can account for um, all sorts of risks across the use of AI, uh, from security risks, but also to human rights related risks. Um, so, so how so are we taking steps? Philip, Go ahead. I, I know we don't have you for that long, uh, and I want to give the, the commission an opportunity to ask you at least one question before you have to peel off. So we sure we, go for it. I don't want to. So if you would just wrap up and uh, quickly, and then I'll open it up for a question, and then because uh, again, we I don't want we I know we're going to lose you pretty soon. So no problem. I've got I've got one more bullet actually. So yeah. um, I just want to note that. One of the steps that NATO is taking to operationalize these principles of responsible use is to actually create something that we're calling the Data and AI Review Board. Um, this will be the world's first international review board to evaluate and to mitigate ethical risks. Um, what we are doing is creating a board here at NATO that will have uh, national representatives from all allies from a wide variety of stakeholders, uh, engineers, uh, ethicists, lawyers, policymakers, uh, end user operators, uh, and this board is going to be responsible for actually taking um, and making tangible pathways uh, so that we can adhere to these principles and to develop them beyond just a word and a few sentences of description and to actually look at how we can integrate those into systems themselves. So with that, I am finished. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you, Philip. Does anyone have a, a question for Philip before we lose him? We'll, we'll open up for one question. Well, I guess yes. just, on the, just on the responsible, when you talk about the review board, the data and AI review board, are you also considering that with respect to, because this is, you talked, you started out talking about emerging technologies generally, so things like quantum and, and um, biotech and the like, is that board, do you envision that having purview over, no, okay. It's just our data principles and it's our AI principles. Right. Well, thank you, Philip. Thank you for uh, calling in from Brussels, and we appreciate your service. Thank you very much. Thanks, guys. Take care. Bye-bye. Okay. So next up, I uh, want to make sure I pronounce your name right, uh, Miri Zilka. Miri is the Research Fellow in Machine Learning and Associate Fellow at the University of Cambridge. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Um, I'm sorry for not speaking very loud. Does this actually work? Oh, we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> Try it. 
Yeah, there you go. Can you hear me? Yes. Great. Yeah, so um, I'm Mary. I work in Cambridge University, and my research the focus is on how can we deploy machine learning and AI in a trustworthy manner. So this was actually those six principles were really the starting point for me. Um, because most of what I do is to try to think how do we go from high level principles to being able to make sure that those can be worked in practice. So the main thing I want to talk to you today is about was accountability. So people talk about accountability in relation to AI quite a lot and how important it is to make sure that accountability is with humans. But in practice, it can be pretty tricky. So if we think, for example, about a case where we have a language language that is getting an AI tool that is predicting whether someone's going to default to their own from a third party supplier. So we have the lender, we have the supplier, we have the customer who's coming to apply for mortgage. And we can consider the rights and responsibilities of each of these parties. So we can imagine that nothing will go wrong and the tool will work perfectly well. But as you can tell by using the technology very works like that in reality. And the question is, what happens when something goes wrong? If the AI does prove to be discriminatory or biased or doesn't work as expected, who is in charge? Is it the lender that is deploying this tool? Is it the supplier that has given this tool? Or nobody at all? So if we decide, and this is not me, but if regulation decides that the lender is responsible, they need to have a way to scrutinize the system in order for them to be able to take responsibility for it. That clashes with proprietary software. If we look at it the other way, we say, no, it's the supplier's responsibility to make sure the tool is not biased. That clashes with how licensing works for software at the moment. For the most part, we buy software, so the, the responsibility is very limited from the developer. So there's a big open question to have these results. Now, if we consider the customer side, I go into the license office and I give my detail, and I want to tell me if I can get more or not. Do they have to tell me that AI is being used in the process of making that decision? Do I have the right to opt out of it? Do I have the right to be explained? How does it work? I don't know. So we can also think about this from a different perspective. And that is how automated the process is, because those questions might have different answers depending on that. So we can define three different modes. So fully automated, for example, if I go on my website, I put my details, and I get decisions straight away. <coughs> That's fully automated system. We can also consider a human in the loop system, where most of the decisions are done automatically, but if the AI is uncertain, then it will pop up this message and go, please call the branch, we cannot give you an answer, and then it goes, I don't know, go to the And the third mode is to use AI as a decision maker, which means that a human decision maker is always making the decision, but they have some tool that gives them, for example, probability. This person has 50% probability. If they 50% probability, they will not be available. So in most states, most of my work, I focus on the criminal justice domain. In that domain, we usually talk about this option. So we a human decision maker in some sort of a system. And that is probably very practical for most cases where you are profiling which means you have a person coming in, giving them the information, and you're making a decision on them. In most cases, you would want a human decision maker to be involved and have not made a tool to get um, some sort of analysis. But we can still talk about accountability in that small setting. Because if I don't know how the AI works, how can I judge whether to take its advice or not? And when that's the case, all I have to go for is my own opinion about AI. And as mentioned, this can be very varied very, and very personal and often almost emotional and irrational. So you can end up with a situation where whether or not people take 
their device by this tool solely depends on whether they or not they think AI is trustworthy, which is not a So uh, this goes back to pre-mentioned uh, explainability. And again, we have proprietary software, we have potentially things that can be defaulted. How can we give the right people the right explanation while preserving intellectual property, while preserving operational capacity? And I, I think that goes back to designing human AI teams in the most efficient way. So you don't have to tell people exactly how things work. That's not important. In many cases, that's also not helpful. If I say to you, okay, well, we have 10,000 data variables, we're going to go through them one by one, and I'm going to tell you exactly how much weight the, the system gives to every variable. By the time you get to 201, you're going to be so So the question is, how can we do, can, how can we give the person the ability to know whether the system is reliable in this specific case, not in general, but in this specific case. So there's a few different methods. Um, one of them is called counterfactual friends. So for example, if you are looking, if you're looking at a decision aid and you're going, I'm a bit worried, I think maybe the system's biased, then you can say to the system, okay, Give me a result for the exact same person, but now I want you to, but now it's female instead of male. How does the result change? So if I can have a discourse with the AI, I can convince myself that my concerns are either valid or not valid, and feel like I can make a good judgment about whether or not to take that advice. So I think when we think about regulation, going back, backwards and thinking about accountability. It's not just about what is the high level principle we want to make sure happen, but we want to make sure that the parties involved have the ability to do what we want them to do. So mentioning small businesses, if we talk about accountability, small companies are very unlikely to want to take the chance of being sued because they have deployed an AI that was discriminatory. So they either decide not, not to play that game and they, they can't be as competitive or they need the rest. So how, how can we help them? So one thing to consider is to have standards. Here, I might ask you. Right. Okay. So I was Sorry. just, no, of course, I was just very quickly going to say that um, one thing to consider is official standards and official bodies that can give those standards so we can um, have some sort of seal of approval that can ensure trust for both the uh, service provider and the yeah. Thank you for your testimony, Mary. Appreciate that very much. So um, last up uh, is Alex Creswell, who's the Vice President of Public Policy at Corps. Alex, thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks for, uh, thanks for being patient. Well, thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak to you today. I'm a, I'm a very bad public speaker, so I'm going to read from my notes uh, on my phone, I'm afraid. So my name's Alex Crespel. I'm uh, working for a company called uh, GraphCore, it's a UK company. And we make systems for artificial AI uh, powered by our own specialist processor, which we call the Intelligent Processing Group, or IPU. GraphCore was um, founded in 2016 by a couple of... Uh, British uh, silicon uh, industry veterans, and it was based on the insights that uh, AI was going to be the most significant technological innovation of the 21st century, perhaps ever. And yet this highly unusual, idiosyncratic form of data processing was being run on processes uh, created for different types of computing altogether, uh, the ones that we call CPUs and uh, GPUs. And whereas every major shift in computing previously had necessitated a new approach on hardware, no such thing uh, existed for AI at that time. So my own background is uh, that I worked for uh, the UK's uh, Foreign Service for, for 30 years in, in hot and dusty places. I, I never uh, cracked the glamours of Washington. 
Um, but uh, I did do uh, a number of national security roles, and, and I was a director of JIO. You didn't miss as much as you might think. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, I headed the, the team of analysts at number 10 that do the UK equivalent to the presidential daily briefing uh, and, and look at um, national security assessment papers. And so, um, so I spent my career horizon scanning to identify what's coming our way, whether that's a threat or a transformative uh, bit of um, technology, and to prepare uh, the UK government accordingly. And so what I want to talk to you today uh, about is something that is, is a threat if you don't equip properly for it, but is also an opportunity. I'm talking about national computing infrastructure and uh, the importance of encouraging diversity of supply in, in hardware on AI. So the pace of artificial intelligence and its current direction of travel mean that our appetite for compute is uh, voracious, if not insatiable. And let's consider the growth in size of uh, the largest AI models. Um, they've become known as foundation models, and, uh, and if you uh, looked at the Economist uh, newspaper uh, magazine uh, this week, they had a, a, a really good article on it, which I uh, commend. <laughs> but foundational models train vast swathes of, of literature and the internet, and they can comprehend and even generate text, speech, and images. And the size, so the size of an AI uh, model can be uh, defined by the number of parameters it has. That's the variables um, that are set as it learns from data. Generally speaking, the larger the model, the more desirable, because they can represent a broader range of uh, learning types, or modalities, and they tend to be more accurate. So five years ago, the largest models were measured in hundreds of millions of parameters. Today, you have single models that are above a trillion parameters, and, and we're just getting started. Um, however, as they grow in size, the compute power and the associated cost of training these models is spiraling. So take the GPT-3 language model uh, from OpenAI created a couple of years ago. It has a now relatively modest 175 billion parameters. The estimated cost of training GPT-3 was between 10 and $20 million. And OpenAI, the organization that created it, started as a non-profit AI research organization, but ultimately turned to corporate patronage to help its, its work. So in 2019, Microsoft donated $1 billion to uh, OpenAI. And more recently, uh, even larger models have primarily been created by big tech companies, uh, such as Google, Microsoft, uh, and Huawei. But innovating, um, innovation in AI shouldn't reside entirely inside private corporations. It should be a joint effort between governments, including national security and, and tech. And in the US, you have significant uh, public compute infrastructure in the form of national labs. Um, four of the world's 10 most powerful supercomputers reside in, in such institutions. But what happens when we move up an order of magnitude or more to 10 or 100 trillion parameter models towards brain scale AI, when training a single model consumes an entire data center full of machines for weeks on end and costs more than putting a satellite into space. Because that's the path that we are currently on and it, and it feels untenable. And it's the reason we need to talk about the hardware. Um, we need to talk about how commercial innovation jointly with governments uh, can preserve US and Western advantage in AI and make that path uh, more tenable. For the most part, today, AI computers carried out on GPUs, graphic processors that were originally designed for gaming, uh, likely modified to accommodate the demands of artificial intelligence. And until now, the response to AI's ballooning compute has been to add more uh, GPUs, um, more racks, bigger data, data centers, more power consumed. And this has just about worked. In, in the same way, it would just about work if you asked a thousand men with spades to dig up a field uh, instead of using a plow. But I think that um, we can't keep on going like this. And in order to solve this crunching capability, we need to achieve a diversity of supply and to evolve from the basic picks and shovels of AI that we have today, CPUs and GPUs, to processes that are designed for big compute. That's the reason that GraphCore was um, 
created. Our IP was designed uh, around the emerging needs of AI, uh, principally to deliver more efficient uh, compute. Uh, one such technique amongst many that, that, that we focus on is called conditional sparsity. And the best analogy of, of that uh, is like the lighting up of a specific neural pathway in your brain when you smell something or you taste something, rather than every single neuron in your brain firing at once. Um, that kind of approach is actually at odds with the fundamental architecture of today's GPUs. Um, and the fact that such um, capability is needed, this new capability is needed to uh, help AI practitioners break out of the restrictions placed on them, um, is, is because today's work, AI work, is tending to incline towards the capability of the available tools. So today, um, GPUs are the sort of dominant tools. So amongst those coming to this realization are many involved in, in your US um, public computer infrastructure who recognize that simply adding more of the same legacy technologies is not the way to use uh, AI compute advertised. So we are today um, uh, installing our IPUs in um, US Department of Energy's uh, labs, Sandia, PNL, and Argon. Um, and, um, and, and Alcat, I might ask you to proceed to the wrap up phase. Okay, so, so the, to cut to um, the quick on this, what I would say is that, um, you know, when we, uh, so, so I would commend to you, first of all, the, um, uh, the National AI uh, Resources uh, Task Force um, report, which makes this point. I would also say that, you know, as most of you will know, the story of ARM, the, the UK-based uh, company that began designing processes for personal computers, their great innovation was the compact, low-power, risk processor design, that all moved to a new chip architecture, the right tools for job, launched a billion smartphones. Today it helps us uh, maintain our edge. Uh, we need something similar for it. Great. Great. Thank you for that, Alex. So now uh, we want to have about uh, 10 to 15 minutes of questions. My uh, co-chair, Congressman Ferguson, has kindly deferred his questions. To, uh, and I think your words were the commissioners ask better questions than we do. <laughs> um, so who's, who wants to start? Rachel. Rachel. First of all, thank you so much. This is also interesting. Um, my question I wanted to direct to Mary, but anyone feel free to chime in. You ended by mentioning, um, you know, related to some of the work you're doing, translating these high level principles into what does it mean practically, especially for small businesses that just want to do the work. You mentioned official bodies that could help sort of make some of these nuanced decisions and guidelines. Can you say more about what that might look like in practice? Is this body, is this ran by the government, is this ran by industry? How do you see this? Um, so I can give you some context about where, so um, a lot of my work is in criminal justice. So I work with police, well, police forces um, that use consultancies or buy out software. But essentially, in that case, they're very much responsible because they're public service. If something goes wrong, if they're biased, they're wrong. But you can really see that they do not have the knowledge or the resource to, to double check that, that this is actually doing what they want it to do, that this is doing properly. Um, and what happens is they try to adopt technologies, and as soon as it's kind of a problem, they just, they just don't want it anymore. They just don't. I don't know. They don't want it. They don't want to focus on and I think in that case, it's very difficult to imagine that they will end up recruiting enough high-level machine learning scientists um, that will be able to investigate the software, even if they weren't required. Um, so I think it's very much needed, definitely for public service, but also for a lot of private sectors in the same situation, that there will be some formal standards then you can say, okay, this has been through these types of checks, for example, for fairness, for bias, for accuracy. It can be defined in many ways. Um, similar to electronics, similar to other industries, where you have a weather and then you have a body that's, that can give you a certificate. So when you're a supplier, you come and sell that tool, you can go, okay, I'm giving you this tool, and it has, and it's here to be 
specific standards that guarantee something, and then you're shifting that accountability, it's not just on one person anymore, it's not just on the supplier, it's not just on the solution. If I could add, so my company is regulated by the domestic regulator, the Financial Conduct Authority. So it acts as a proxy for standards, to Mira's point. So clients who engage with us know that, that my company is regulated. I, as a director, bear both a personal and potentially criminal risk if we fail our clients. I could personally go to prison. That's the sort of extent of the regulation. Every day that bothers me, I don't know why, but it's just one of those things. Um, can't think about that. Uh, but I use that not as a not as a sort of you know stamp of approval, if you like, but as a reassurance in the absence of other things. It means that we as an organization don't want to be a bad actor within the regulatory perimeter. So we will take decisions about all of the elements of our service that means that I can sleep better at night, which means that, you know, we may not take some higher risk changes. We may just play inside our own sandbox or join their sandbox if we want to test something. So I think there are places you can go to, but that's just one sector, you know. So I, I take comfort from it, and I know my clients do, but I agree with Nira, if there was something that enabled sort of almost a stamp mark that we all signed up to, that would be a really interesting way of getting through this acceptance issue that, that we encounter. Mm, that's great. Richard, if I, if I could just put sure. one thing on that. So my sense is that the insurance sector mm. will be a real driver in this, just as they have proven standards in, for instance, cybersecurity and visibility. Makes sense. It's a kind of digital parameter that people are putting together. Uh, and it's a really good tool for policy makers. Yeah, they have to underwrite it, so they'll care about it. Chris? Yeah, well, thank you for, for a great uh, panel. Um, I just had one question for Alex on the kind of um, uh, semiconductor side. Um, the, you did a great job, I think, laying out the kind of economic and business imperative for why we need to move away from the effectively like the volume of an architecture from the 50s on. And kind of, uh, you know, we've now got the GPUs and the TPUs with, we need to kind of move beyond that. I can light the scaling laws that we've seen uh, uh, with AI. You did a great job kind of laying out that, that kind of research and uh, business imperative there. I wanted to just uh, see if you had any thoughts on the strategic imperative behind yeah, kind of strategic competitiveness with this, with respect in particular to, say, China or others who might view this as this is kind of the first time we've seen a break in the kind of prevailing paradigm of computing. Uh, you know, semiconductors effectively, and there's an opportunity for them to see this as kind of a lead product, like a potential technology that they can lead product uh, with. And I, I'm, I'm just curious if that's something that you are concerned about or, or are thinking about as well. Yeah, um, I think if you, know, if you see um, the current competition between the West and China uh, with technology at its center as a kind of overarching paradigm. Um, I would say that um, there are some similarities here with the situation we found ourselves on 5G, where there was a um, there was not sufficient diversity of supply. Uh, you know, you, you had Huawei and ZTE, for instance, were were providing switch gear and routers for 52 percent of the of the world's uh, mobile internet, internet infrastructure. And you want to get into a place where you have that diversity of supply and you do not have dominance by one or two companies such that everyone trains up to using their gear or is, you know, you, you, you get a distortion. Um, and I think the way to do that is, and in fact if the US is doing it, um, is to promote it at a, um, a national accelerator, innovation accelerator level, but it, there are other policy tools that you need to use. And in Europe, it's really um, noteworthy that you know, Graphcore is the only AI hardware company, process company in Europe. There, there are no you know, Nokia's or Ericsson's in this space, and they could do more. And you know, there, there's no cognitive reason why that should be the case. Other questions? Okay, so, so when, you, when you talk about how uh, we just find adherence to the supply chain of computers for AI, 
um, but when you talk about you, I, I get the sense you're talking about diversity of character types, and I guess I'm wondering about just how do you ensure a diverse, robust source of compute for the AI, you know, whether it's um, AWS only, but making sure if Amazon is disrupted, um, people, small businesses, large businesses can still build AI. Um, have you, do you think of it in those terms, or are you focusing more on the diversity of character types? So, so if, I, if I'm getting your question right, I, I, this is, I, mean, I think there is something here about allowing, first of all, allowing big cloud providers to, you know, list a real diversity of, of um, different computes. So, so making that happen uh, at the moment is quite concentrated, but also there might be something in there about um, diversity or, or expanding the, the amount of uh, specialist cloud providers uh, that are available to companies and to researchers and to just people in the street who want to, um, who may come from a disadvantaged background, for instance, who want access to um, AI computing. Great. If I just one just a little point on that is that so as a as a business that built its tech on one of the big boys, obviously because that's how it works. If they fall over for any reason, we fall over. We have no fail-safe. There is no backup generator. Um, you know, and so my, my current issue is I will look to mitigate my business risk by going hybrid between two or possibly even three, if I could bear that level of complexity of the big providers. Um, my data team are going to have a little cry in a corner when they realise. But my risk is too high because I can't do my business, I can't serve my clients if there's an issue. There's not been an issue, but I can't live in a world where I don't plan for there being an issue. So I think increasingly, if we are able as SMBs to find our way to a hybrid supply chain, that would be a really powerful way forward, but it increases my company complexity is the downside. And can you handle the cost and the complexity at the moment, trying to manage the AWS as you have the same time for your new system? Complexity, yes. Cost, I'm going to go hard in negotiating, telling them how much they must want my type of business. I think you'll do okay in that. Thank you. <laughs> so I want to thank Zita Miri and Alex for your testimony. Thank you very much. I think I'll turn it over to my co-chair for our next set of panel. Thank you, John. Yeah. So while our panelists in the room change seats. We'll begin the next panel with our uh, <laughs> virtual participant. Uh, Laura Galindo Romero is the AI and Privacy Policy Manager at OpenLoop at uh, Meta. And Laura, I believe you are there with us virtually. Can you hear us? Yeah, can you hear me? Great. The next seven or eight minutes are all yours. Great. Um, thank you. Thank you for everyone. And, and thank you to the organizers uh, at the U.S. Chamber of Commerce Technology Engagement Center for this invitation and the honor to, to join this conversation. Uh, my name is Laura Galindo and I'm an AI policy manager at Meta. Unfortunately, my colleague, Dr. Versana Duvala, is sick and couldn't be in person today in London. So I hope to do my best efforts to share with you what we have been doing at Meta, particularly through one innovative and proactive initiative, the Open Loop Program, as well as other initiatives promoting inclusiveness in AI ethics across different regions. It is my pleasure to introduce you an experimental and evidence-based initiative that aims to contribute to informing the debate around AI governance, the AI, the Open Loop program. What is Open Loop? Open Loop is a global program that connects policymakers and technology companies to help develop effective and evidence-based policies around AI and other emerging technologies. The program, supported by Meta, previously Facebook, builds on the collaboration and contributions of a consortium composed of regulators, governments, tech businesses, academics, and civil society organizations. Through experimental governance methods, Open Loop members co-create policy prototypes and test different approaches to laws and regulations before they are enacted, improving the quality of rulemaking processes in the field of tech policy. Also, reviewing and revisiting existing regulations to see uh, rooms for, for improvement and iteration. So regarding policy prototyping, Open Loop approaches policy making in a similar way to how technology is built, through an experimental and iterative way. 
for example, the alpha phases, research experimentation to test different regulatory pathways, and beta phases, where we iterate and refine these frameworks before releasing them broadly. Uh, I will spend a little bit on the idea of policy prototyping for those of you who are not familiarized with, with this methodology. Uh, we believe that the idea of policy prototyping will lead to more effective and evidence-based policy making while avoiding the social societal costs associated with bad policy. These costs can be of an economic nature, for instance, high compliance costs, high enforcement costs, or loss of opportunity, which of course inhibit competitiveness. The policy prototyping may be especially useful in areas where the pace of technological development and innovation is high and where formal legislation tends to struggle to keep up. Prior to rolling out a new governance framework, a proposed law, codes of conduct, standards, guidelines, etc., policy prototyping can be a shift, an agile way to understand the framework's effects, strengths, and limitations. So what, what we believe is that through policy prototyping, uh, prototyping we can help policymakers and users and all the stakeholders associated with the development, deployment of AI systems to better understand the context and, and, and extent in which future policies uh, would need to be clearer, relevant, and effective before the turning into a robust or fully fin fin fleshed version that, that might come and that might inhibit competitiveness, innovation, and so on. So how do we do this? What, what is the methodology? A typical policy prototyping program follows a, a couple of fundamental main steps in, in rolling out its programs. As I mentioned, we are a consortium. So we gather a group of tech companies, in this case, uh, pr those are provisioning products or services powered by AI technologies. We call them participants. Second, we co-create normative frameworks or, or leverage existing ones, policy prototyping, uh, on a specific topics related to emerging technologies, including AI. We call these policy prototypes. For example, um, and, and just uh, to give you some sense of what we have done, what we're doing and we, what we plan to do, in Europe, we partner with 10 European AI businesses to co-create and test an AI risk assessment framework, akin to the GDPR's data protection impact assessments on different AI applications. The results and recommendations of this program are being published in the, um, are published in the Open Loop website, which I invite you all to visit, openloop.org. And these gave many insights on, on what could work and not with regards to, for example, regulatory sandboxes. Uh, this has already informed and shaped thinking and policies associated with, um, with, with regulatory sandboxes, as we're seeing now in different proposals of the EU AI Act. In Asia and Latin, we're currently partnering with Singapore and Infocom's Media Development Authority and the Data Protection Commission of Mexico to test different artificial intelligence uh, uh, exploitable AI regulatory frameworks. There, similarly, in, in Asia, we, we cooperated to test specific concepts, processes, and guidance on AI explainability and transparency based on an already existing framework the Singapore Model AI Governance Framework and its companion guide. And in Mexico, we launched a policy prototyping program in collaboration with our regional partner, C-Mines and the Inter-American Development Group, um, with support of the Mexican DPA, to test a, a prototype completely from scratch on, on how companies will, will see these, this prototype that already embodied some of the current um, regulatory efforts around the world, particularly in matters related to, to risk management and mitigating different risks of, of AI, particularly for explainability. So two things important to note about this program is how, how this approach and how, how this proposal uh, is, is very f flexible and versatile. It's inclusive, um, versatile and flexible because, because we, we incorporate it, um, we adopt either existing legal frameworks or upcoming legal frameworks, um, but also uh, it promotes inclusivity by providing access to findings in a, in a way that all the reports that are published come and are freely available under a Creative Commons uh, license so that anybody can leverage and build on this uh, uh, methodology to, to co-create and to, to think about how to do more prototyping when it comes to um, to different frameworks to govern emerging technologies. 
What we plan to do uh, right now with the UA Act, perhaps you would be very interested as this is uh, very topical. We are now starting a second uh, pr uh, policy prototyping program in Europe, uh, where we plan to test selective provisions of the EU AI Act together with AI companies and other partners. We have already over 40 companies that have confirmed their participation from all over the, the world that will have operations in Europe to test with them key provisions such as AI actors definitions, notions of high risk, operationalization of risk management frameworks, technical documentation requirements, regulatory sandboxes, and more. With these, we plan to produce different policy recommendation reports on what needs to be um, looked again, what is working, what are a companies understanding, what they are not understanding, and how they are implementing or even planning to comply with these requirements. These insights will be extremely valuable to improve, again, governing uh, emerging technologies and, and, and rethink what needs to be adjusted in upcoming regulation. We're also working on an open loop program in India and Japan dedicated to the operationalization of our principles, taking the local and regional context into account. And this is one that, 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 that's coming that is very interesting because here we will look specifically of competitive issues when it comes to different jurisdictions, when it comes to take cultural aspects into account and different set of understanding and legal frameworks. So why we're doing this? Perhaps this is Laura, the main question you have right now. Laura, Laura, if you can hear me, if I could just ask you to take a moment to wrap up. Thank you so much. It sounds like you are. Yes, I am. <laughs> Thank you so much. So we believe that there is an tap potential for policy, legal and design experimentation that has not been sufficiently leveraged and utilized. In addition to and as a way to complement regulatory sandboxes, we believe that through experimental governance methods such as policy prototyping programs, we will be able to attain a more anticipatory a stakeholder inclusive and holistic experimental governance platform to examine and test different regulatory and non-regulatory instruments. We believe that while working with policymakers and the stakeholders on AI policy is one part of the puzzle to find inclusive and innovative ways to govern trustworthy AI. Another important mission is to empower people and build capacity so that no one is left behind. And we're doing that by promoting a, a, several research programs and calls for, for papers on AI ethics across the globe, including India, APEC region, LATAM and others. Thank you very much for, for the opportunity to join us. And I'm happy to answer your questions regarding the Open Loop program. Thanks. Thank you very much, Laura. Thank you for um, pinch hitting for your colleague. We hope she's feeling better very soon. And we hope you'll stay with us uh, as we hear from our other panelists and uh, be available for questions. Um, next, we are going to go to uh, Tanya Duarte. Tanya is the uh, co-founder of We and AI. The floor is yours. Hi, thank you very much for inviting me. Um, so yes, I'm Tanya Duarte. I'm co-founder of We and AI, which is a UK non-profit focusing on activating diverse communities to make AI work for everyone. Our programs are based around improving general levels of AI literacy and routes to participate, participation in development or discourse related to AI. I'm also the founding editorial board for the Springer AI and Ethics Journal, an advisor to AI testing software company Etic AI, and a lead for tech for disability, a working group of tech and advocates. I am a member of the IEEE P7015 Data and AI Literacy Skills and Readiness Working Group. Um, and before this, had a 30-year career in consultancy and commercial management roles across various industries and tech startups. So we and AI have been working since the beginning of 2020 to increase the awareness of, um, and understanding of AI among the general UK population to enable participation in individual, organisational or democratic means of securing trust with the AI. We do this by engaging people with potential risks and rewards and signposting the different ways which, in which they can have their voice represented um, in decisions about its use. So what we found is that as the buzz around artificial intelligence has increased, so have the issues around trust, and that's really what I'm here to talk about. The excitement over the transformational efficiencies and life-enhancing applications AI brings are being overshadowed by concerns about the hidden dangers of AI. The bias embedded in, embedded in the code, um, the exclusion, marginalisation and displacement caused by the rapid automation um, financial services have obviously had 
many um, high profile cases of discriminatory lending algorithms, um, hiring, using buy software, etc. Businesses and organisations in a market economy are based on trust between stakeholders that each party is acting in good faith. However, without enough information, transparency and dialogue between all stakeholders, particularly those currently most underrepresented in their AI data sets, the workforce and decision making, neither trusted nor more important trustworthy AI is possible. Lack of trust is a huge barrier to successful innovation and consumer adoption. And lack of inclusion and stakeholder input into AI design, development and deployment, risk-making products which are not robust, competitive and are harmful and carry both societal and commercial risk. However, so this you probably all know, but uh, I'm going to take a slightly different approach now. Rather than engaging and educating the public on the realities, debates and potential of AI-enabled products and services, tech organisations, politicians and media outlets are often responsible for actually misrepresenting AI technologies, misleading as to its current capabilities and cloaking the human agency behind it. This can be seen in the use of language, which often states um, in press releases and news articles that AI can think and understand and implies that it has sentience. It does not. Um, and as a side for anyone currently uh, watching the, the debate calls uh, going on on social media and in the press about the current transcripts, Transcript interpretation being circulated by an ex-Google engineer claiming that Lambda is sentient to show that it's not just the public who needs reminding um, of that AI is not sentient. Professor Joanna Bryson this morning asked me to convey um, in preparation while I was preparing for this session that Google could do with clarifying that the stochastic parrots that um, Drs. Emily Bender Tim Gebru, Margaret Mitchell um, have identified um, large scale language models, for example, as being, are not moral patients. The same can be said for the models created from those NLP models, such as um, OpenAI's DALI um, and, Image and Google's Imogen. So I started to talk about images because what we found, uh, we in AI, when engaging people in learning, is that they already had a literal picture in their head of what AI was gathered from media and business communications, from popular culture and news headlines. The images which come to mind when people think of AI are influenced, of course, by the Terminator, but also the predominance of brains made from glowing circuit boards, computer code cascading, cascading through the space, white anthropomorphized robots looking pensive and doing a range of human jobs against a blue background. A Google image search for AI or artificial intelligence quickly reveals the striking prevalence of these images, often accompanied by white men in business suits. And yet, research has been published which shows that unrealistic or distorted narratives mislead the public about the scale and scope of AI's current use and impact. They sow fear and create barriers to understanding and engagement with AI. They're also laden with historical assumptions about gender, ethnicity, and religion. The prevalence of blue in these images, for instance, is an unhealthy echo of the idea that computer science is a male subject while the robots in these images are nearly always white and masculine. A dominant trope illustrating human-centered AI is based on Michelangelo's creation of Adam Fresco, with white robot and white human hand touching across space, often swapped round to give AI godlike qualities. Clearly, many of these images show machines as being sentient, but this sets unrealistic expectations and masks the accountability of humans, implying that AI is making the decisions. We need to remind ourselves that AI is very much a human endeavour and that AI researchers and developers need to be making thoughtful, transparent decisions. Until general populations get more literate about how AI is used in their lives and how it actually manifests, they'll not be able to participate in the critical thinking or dialogue which underpins a decision on what technology they deem worthy of their trust. To tackle this issue, we in AI brought together a wide range of individuals and organisations because there is a real lack of images which show real life applications, settings and impacts of AI and of the people involved. We are reimagining how to communicate AI through the Better Images of AI programme which you can find at betterimagesofai.org. We are exploring, creating and commissioning new ways to visually represent AI and have launched a gallery of images that can be downloaded for free under a Creative Commons licence. The images downloadable from the Better Images site have descriptions which help to explain AI by including, detail, including detailed descriptions of the specific technologies, applications, metaphors, concepts or elements depicted. 
Defining better requires an immense appreciation of technical and cultural nuances. And the process of identifying and explaining images which are more specific, relevant, realistic and inclusive for different people and industries is an endeavour which needs global and multidisciplinary input. And I should say, which also helps many people explore their own organisation's products along the way. The project is therefore an open collaboration between many global volunteer researchers, technologists, artists and other ex experts and stakeholders. It's underpinned by the collaboration with BBC R&D, the Lieberman Centre for Future Intelligence at the University of Cambridge, and ex-lab at the Berg Geibekenstein University of Art and Design in Germany. Founding supporters include the UK's AI Institute, the Alan Turing Institute, the Ada Lovelace Institute, Finnish Centre for AI, AI Sweden, All Tech is Human, and various other bodies. We'd very much like to invite the US Chamber of Members to engage with this non-profit programme and help us to develop more helpful and responsible ways of communicating AI. Current opportunities to engage include participation in a UK Arts and Humanities Research Council funded project in which Dr. Cantor de Hull, who's a leading academic in global AI narratives, is researching what uses of these images, including those from commercial organisations, uh, need from visual communication and evaluating the effectiveness of the new images we've identified. We can advise on design briefs and approaches and competitions to create new art and artists in residency programmes to help companies develop better ways to engage their workforce and the public in their AI-enabled products and services, um, which is also part of building that trust and understanding, mutual understanding. For innovation to flourish and benefit all people, it must be trusted. To increase trust, we need transparency and accuracy in how AI is represented. As we build our gallery, we need support. So please get in touch if you have ideas um, or funding to help commission artists and develop guidance. And at the very least, I hope everyone now conduct audits of visual representations um, that people use to identify the untrustworthy tropes. Consider more inclusive and realistic ways of communicating and avoid AI hype and overstatement. Thank you very much. Uh, next, we will hear from uh, Rohit Israni, Chairman of Insight, Insights, INCITS, Artificial Intelligence. Rohit, the floor is yours. Sure. Thank you, Co-Chair Delany and Ferguson, distinguished members of the AI Commission. Uh, I'm the Chair of Insights AI, and I will shortly speak up a little bit. I'm the Chair of Insights AI, and I will shortly explain what that is. Uh, I'm also in my day job a director of the cloud and AI ecosystem at Intel and also a liaison to OECD uh, from uh, the international standards being developed called SC32. So my previous speakers have actually motivated uh, the topic that I'm going to speak on and I request Michael to allow me to come in advance because I expected uh, some of these issues and topics would come up so I don't them. But essentially, I'm going to give you a testimony on how international AI standards could be a tool for policymakers and regulators and mitigate risks while enabling worldwide innovation. Uh, one of my fellow panelists in the prior panel very eloquently put the need that is there for AI standards, as Ms. Miri Zilka pointed out. There is a need for international AI standards that will have an ecosystem approach. Consider emerging requirements from a comprehensive range of perspectives, such as regulatory, business, sector-specific, societal, and ethics. There's a need for assimilating these requirements in the context of the use of these technologies, translating them to technical requirements, and developing horizontal del deliverables that can enable responsible adoption of AI across industry sectors. And there's also a need for this effort to be international in nature, and that is what international AI standards being developed by ISO and IEC are attempting to do. So the JTC1 is the IT arm of the ISO and IEC, and SC42 uh, is a sub subcommittee developing international AI standards. Uh, currently, 50 countries are engaged in the development of international AI standards. 
Uh, this includes all the major countries that are involved in developing AI technology, 35 in participating status, and 15 in observing status. Also, it was pointed out that there are multiple sets of frameworks and many stakeholders who are developing various perspectives around governance, around risk for AI. Uh, this committee, the ISOSC 42 committee, has liaisons with 45 such entities, uh, which include uh, the Organization of Economic Cooperation and Development, of which I am the liaison, the European Commission, the European Trade Union Confederation in the European context, and several others. Now, the question is, how does the U.S. participate in the development of international standards? Uh, participation in standards in the U.S. is voluntary, and the International Committee for Information Technology Standards is the central U.S. forum dedicated to creating technology standards for the next generation of innovation. INSIT's AI, which I am the chair, uh, is the body that's actually contributing uh, U.S. positions to international standard developments. You can think of it as the mirror committee for the U.S. for the international ISO IC42 committee. Uh, participation in this committee includes uh, several of the major technology companies, uh, as Intel, Google, Microsoft, IBM, and I can certainly uh, give you the roster of companies participating on request. It also includes government bodies such as Department of Defense, Department of Commerce, NIST. It includes research institutions and universities. Now, the question is, this is a very holistic uh, piece of work that needs to be done and has many things that need to be organized and put together in a systematic manner. And that's where the program of the work of SC42 addresses these areas. And there are nine key areas. Uh, the first thing that the Commission has started and many other regulators is what is the definition of AI. There's a lot of policy discussions on that. And those are the foundational standards. Uh, experts from 35 countries deliberated and came up with the definition of uh, what is AI. The entire sets of terms of uh, various uh, uh, concepts used in AI are defined in foundational standards. Then there are application guidelines of use cases which actually re you require them to develop horizontal deliverables. Then there are computational aspects which deal with hardware, which is heterogeneous in nature, CPUs, GPUs, ASICs, FPGAs, a whole set of software stacks. Then there is the data ecosystem uh, in which there was already standards work going on in big data at the ISL, ISO level, which was brought into SC42. In addition, a five-part series on data quality, which is very relevant to, to AI, was added. And then very important areas of perhaps uh, interest to the Commission, trustworthiness, the ethical aspects and societal concerns, the testing of AI-based AI systems, management system standards, and governance implications. These nine areas are what the SC42 program is for the crisis. I will briefly talk about three or four of these that are perhaps of most interest uh, in this context here starting with trustworthiness. AI is often viewed as a black box, and there is a general lack of understanding of how AI makes decisions. And as we heard from some of our colleagues in finance, trust is the currency. At the very first level, there is a need for defining the various terms that are used in this context and have a congruent vocabulary, a congruent understanding of what they do. This is the first uh, piece of work that was done by C42. Uh, in addition to this, developing technical standards to address these aspects include application of existing ISO risk management frameworks to AI, the quality model for AI systems, quality evaluation guidelines, and then as we heard, explainability, controllability, transparency, taxonomy, the functional safety of AI, and also, uh, very importantly, the assessment of neural networks and the treatment of unwanted bias. This is the body of work on trustworthiness that is ongoing uh, with the published uh, uh, technical report, as I mentioned, on trustworthiness and multiple reports in various stages of development. Uh, the ethical aspects of AI is the second area that I will just highlight, and that is embedded in the entire body of work of SC42. 
Uh, so you could just take one more minute to wrap up your sure. your comments. Thank you. Sure. Uh, the use cases, for example, use ethical aspects, uh, and they are actually defined in the context. Uh, to wrap up, as we look at policy and regulation, we're seeing this move, and the Commission points out in the RFI that there's a consensus that's building between regulatory authorities in the U.S. around risk-based approaches. This is similar from the OECD and the NIST uh, approach, and that's where you know, you have different sets of requirements depending on the risk of the application, but there is a need for having a standard that could form uh, what could be certified, what could be auditable, and that's where management system standards, uh, which are developed by C42, are most useful. The second thing being at the board level, being able to ask the right questions of AI and get the right answers, which are the governance implications, which are the other two parts which perhaps could be a road for policymakers uh, uh, to get around, you know, uh, putting forth innovation and uh, regulation at the same time. Super. Really, thank you very much. Sure. Last on this panel, we'll hear from Nathan Benich, founder of Air Street. Nathan, please correct my pronunciation of your name. Benich, is good. All right. Thank you. Great. Well, thanks so much for uh, taking the time to listen to some of my remarks. Um, so I'm the founder and partner of Airstream Capital, which is a venture fund investing in early stage AI companies, in technology and life science in Europe and the United States. Um, annually, I also co-author a state of the art report, which is about 160 slides or so, tends to grow with inflation every year. And um, is that, on your, is that on your website? It's uh, it's one of my turning points. No. Um, and it covers research, industry, geopolitics, and talent. Uh, I'm also a trustee of a nonprofit that works on AI education and events and the open source um, AI fellowships and fund fellowships. And my background's in computational bio um, in undergrad in the UK and the US. So today I want to touch on three topics. So number one is spin outs, which is um, basically the formation of companies out of academic research and why that's a really high lever, uh, what really high policy lever. The second is uh, AI for science, uh, particularly in biology and why it's a critical aspect of industry that we should be supporting for decades to come. And the third is this topic that we heard a little bit about um, from uh, Representative from Graphcore, which is trying to normalize the chasm between industry and academia in terms of compute resources and talent. So on spin outs, um, so these are basically startups that are essentially a vehicle to commercialize academic research. And as we know in AI, this is a deeply scientific uh, discipline where a lot of new inventions emerge from academia or by researchers who are trained in academia and now work in other places. And the US has a long history of supporting these kinds of spin outs. If you look at recent examples in AI, including Databricks, which is almost a $40 billion company, or any scale, which is a billion dollar company, both of them from Berkeley, or Sam Bonova and Snorkel from Stanford, these are all uh, pretty amazing companies that tackle real areas of the economy. And they also have federal arms, so they serve the US government too. But while there is a ton of academic research that's published every year, spin outs as a proportion of overall startups in the economy are very, very small, they count for a tiny fraction. And so that's not super intuitive. And I think the process, or well, the reason, is that the process of forming a company out of academic research is far too cumbersome, it's opaque, and generally comes with pretty unfriendly terms, which hampers the ability of the company to actually build over the long term. And I know this because over the last 12 months, we've been running a crowdsourcing project that we just released today. And um, the effort was essentially to create a sort of glass door for spin outs. So asking founders to submit their deal terms in a lot of granular detail. So we could draw some geographical trends as to what universities have great policies and which ones have less great policies. And so far, we've received about 140 responses from 71 institutions around the world. If we focus on the US data points, we can see from the data that it takes on average nine months from the idea that a PhD student wants to form a company to then being able to actually walk out of the university with a company in hand and start doing business. Actually, two thirds of companies take over six months and half of them take over a year. Some of them take 24 months. You can cast that against a normal startup where a founder can raise money in three months. This is extremely problematic for fields like AI because of their open source nature. If you don't move fast, others will and they'll eat your lunch. The second feature that's problematic is equity. 
there's a very, very large range that's taken by universities on different grounds. So there's no standard. It can either be 0% or north of 20%. Founders overall rate the process about 4.4 out of 10. So if this were a software company, it wouldn't be anywhere close to product market fit. And perhaps the most, um, most saddening to me is that actually two thirds of students wouldn't donate back to their university. So aside from a few lighthouse universities that are amazing at spin outs like Stanford and MIT, I think mean, the rest are largely more of a hindrance than a help. And this is something that we can fix quite easily. Because there are examples of universities pivoting to being more entrepreneurial, like Caltech, which traditionally said that the only way to be successful at the Institute was to become a Nobel laureate. And now for the last 10, 15 years, it's actually cool to become a founder and accepted to do that. And so, you know, the modern generation sees that most ambitious academic talent actually wants to see their inventions through into the real world, not just write papers. So if we are to remove the drag coefficient around the formation of spin-outs, then I think universities that do that will become the most attractive in the world. Because if academics actually have a choice, they would happily move somewhere that is more entrepreneurial. So I think a big opportunity here. The second thing I want to talk about is AI for science. Uh, we've had numerous examples of AI being used in finance, advertising, you know, online commerce, etc. But I think now there's many more examples that AI is actually being used to model climate, uh, manage supply and demand on the energy grid, detect disease, design drugs, even control nuclear fusion reactors. So it's pretty clear that AI is the most, one of the most important levers on tech progress more broadly. And I think one of the new areas that we should be investing in, in the next few decades is in biotechnology which is basically the engine of creating new medicines and diagnostics and things of that nature. So the traditional um, so status quo is that a drug costs over a billion dollars and takes a decade to develop, and we all know that most of academic research in biology is irreproducible. Um, but it's not only about drug development, it's also about generating new materials from, um, from nature, reducing the reliance on petrochemicals, detecting disease faster, triaging patients in the emergency room, etc. But actually, in my job as a VC, when I speak to you know, different investors in the ecosystem, I haven't seen a topic that's as polarizing as investing in the new breed of biotechnology companies. Most still think that software really won't make that much of a difference, that it's just a little bit of automation sprinkled on you know, computational chemistry of yesteryear. But I think what we're talking about is a much more fundamental rethink of how experiments are run and how we can industrialize uh, the business of biology and discovery. So really, we should be thinking about it as moving from a local maximum where we believe that what we have today is best in class and using computers to get us to a far bigger one. So this, as we discussed a little bit today, requires new infrastructure, new data, perhaps a rethink to some of the approval processes in the FDA, given that a lot of these systems are continually updating over time and are not static entities. And so given that a lot of consumer technology that we enjoy today was funded by the government and by defense many, many years ago, perhaps we should have a similar focus now going forward on biology. And so the last point I want to cover is this topic of industry versus academia and the real, the real key drivers there. One is compute driving research and the other one is talent. So consider that today about 88% of top AI faculty receive money from big technology companies, such Google, Amazon, et cetera. So you can think that big technology companies have the ability to influence the direction of research, events, decisions, and agendas that actually follow this money. Consider also that the percentage of large-scale AI results from academia fell from 90% in 1960 to 60% in 2010, and over the last decade it's dropped to basically zero. Consider also that we have this feature of elites working with elites, which is basically driving this process of democratization of AI research which is to say that if you're at a top university, you work with the top technology companies. Top tech companies don't work with bottom tier universities. And we've seen multiple accounts of academics having to use their own personal credit card to buy access to computers because some of the reasons are that grants actually reject the use of funds on compute, which for a topic like computer science is just almost impossible to imagine. On the talent side, we've seen a massive depletion of academic talent in university as a result of far more compelling opportunities in industry. This is because of higher salaries, uh, access to compute, um, and less administrative burden. We've also seen this expressed as a great brain drain. So in 2019, for example, there are about 33 faculty that departed CMU, Georgia Tech, Washington, Berkeley. They went to places like Google, DeepMind, Amazon. 
it's notable that 85% of those people were professors. These are highly talented individuals. And perhaps lastly to close, consider that China is actually outpacing US yeah, in terms of STEM PhD growth. So they're actually projected to reach double the number of STEM PhD students by 2025. Meanwhile, in the Western world, we see numerous examples of depleting STEM budgets in academia, which is driving this uh, exodus into industry. And so I think, uh, I think I'll just wrap up here. Um, I hope this topic of uh, spin-outs has been an interesting kind of window into how we can um, you know, build better and bigger AI companies domestically and can drive tech sovereignty. That AI for science and especially biology is a new frontier that we should be doubling down on. And that this chasm between industry and academia is fixable, and I think it's something we can do in the short term before the damage is done long term. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Uh, great panel. We're going to take some time for questions. I'd love to prioritize folks who haven't had a chance to ask a question yet. Does anyone have any questions for this panel? I'll go ahead and. Yes, go ahead. Come on. So, this is for, for um, all of the speakers. Thanks once again for the insightful input. From the innovation perspective, given that uh, these AI models do train from um, diverse data sets, how would you attribute credit for innovations that result from these models? Um, and how, how does that integrate with the startup ecosystem and the innovation ecosystem? As in just a other question, if I as a consumer submit my data to a company that then uses the data to train a model and has some value out of it, how do I get value back? There's, there's some breakthrough medical innovation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think this is a great opportunity to explore some of these, uh, some, you know, this idea of an AI commons, which is perhaps this technology is just so ubiquitous and so important to everybody that there should be some sort of, you know, the extra structure there that maybe sits aside from government, aside from private companies. Um, <clears throat> and that creates these sort of foundation style models that everybody can benefit from in a different kind of way. Um, there's some technical innovations that might enable that, like federated learning where I don't necessarily need to see your private data. Um, but I don't think this is solved. I think there's an opportunity for a kind of new framework that can move. Yeah, perhaps I could, I could speak to perhaps an example in a use case that is very commonly used, something like face recognition. And innovation in face recognition happens in multiple areas. One example of that and how it could relate to policy and, and the governance. You know, uh, in my job at Intel, I came across uh, this use case where uh, uh, an innovator in Brazil uh, was at an airport. He was a graduate student from the US return, uh, University returning home. And at the airport, he saw this uh, young girl who was paralyzed neck down, and she couldn't move her wheelchair. And she was having a really hard time navigating this wheelchair. And he thought of an idea. She had a very beautiful smile. And he thought, what if her smile could drive this wheelchair? Uh, so that's a place where uh, facial expression and data based on that created innovation. And it's an AI for good use case. And thinking about like the policy perspective or, or, or the government's perspective, in such cases, the consumer would be most interested in functional safety aspects of the of a, of a facial recognition use case. If you translate that to something like in the back of a cab, if there happens to be a camera that's looking at you and it's actually putting forth advertisements, right? And it's based on your mood, if it's giving you different ads, uh, it's not as much a functional safety issue, it's perhaps a privacy issue. And there is perhaps, uh, let us say, besides being able to give you ads based on you know, what your expression was or what, what, what you looked like. It also did something like, uh, you know, based on imagery, one could diagnose perhaps a stroke in advance or, you know, what, or somebody seems so sick and distraught that, you know, they could be needing some medical help. So it has that element of it. Then it's a trade-off between good versus, you know, giving up some privacy. And that's where the management system standards or the policy frameworks could evolve. And you can move that to one more extreme uh, facial recognition app based on training data, creating innovation, and actually giving you drugs, uh, saying that you're depressed and you, know, you need to take XYZ drugs. And that will require a completely different set of uh, policies, a different set of standards and governance. Any other questions? 
Yes, go ahead, Christine. So, so thanks, everybody, and, and thanks, Laura. Um, my question is probably for Laura and Rohit, both of you. Like, I'm curious about how you see the interrelationship between standards development and these risk assessment frameworks, because there's so many different conversations happening around the globe, particularly on the risk assessments, and then, so, I, and one has to ultimately inform the other, I would think, right? We'll settle on something somewhere. So how do you, do you see it playing out that way and how? Yes, actually, uh, if you see the risk assessment frameworks in both in the US and, and, and in Europe, right? In, the, in Europe, OECD was one of the organizations that came up uh, with the risk assessment framework. And I turned in a contribution to them, tying that risk assessment framework to standards. Similarly, NIST, which is participating in AI standards, right. has a risk assessment framework. Now, the question in the risk assessment framework comes up is that based on the level of risk, you have a level of impact. And based on that, you have a policy recommendation. Now, the question that happens is, what do you do with that policy recommendation? And that's where you need something like a management system standard, uh, which is used in different other industries. And just to explain that in a second, uh, a standard that goes to processes. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, in a company that's doing like a hiring application, they would have a system standard that doesn't just testify the application, perhaps there could be something to that effect, but looks at, did you process the data for bias? You look at the model for bias as a set of you know, check marks, and at a higher level, at a governance aspect of it, right? And that's where these management system standards and governance standards could play with the risk assessment frameworks together. And you would have certification. Can we give Laura the last word on that? Laura, could you hear the question? Uh, yes, uh, the relationship between risk assessment and and, and standards. If I'm not wrong, right? Yes. Yeah. Thank you for that question, and, and I'll just echo what, what my previous co-panelists mentioned. Uh, before joining Meta, I actually work as part of the OECD Policy Observatory, where I closely follow this development and evolution from AI principles to to develop different policy frameworks and understanding of classification of AI systems, and and the the national the, let's say the natural uh, evolution of that is going to, to risk management and standards. One thing to, to perhaps to think about is that in the catalog of tools that policymakers are having at its disposal, uh, in addition to the spectrum up from soft law instruments to hard law instruments and all in between considering also policy experimentation, I think it's, there is a unique opportunity to harness the, the latest developments and thinking on on how to approach governing emerging tech, and particularly AI, and the and the and the challenges it poses, through um, through a policy prototyping uh, methodology and 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 other experimentation tools. Of course, policy prototyping is not only the the, the only tool; it is one of the set of tools that policymakers have at its disposal. But it's worth considering, uh, given how much known unknowns and knowns there are in, with regards to these technologies and potentially new emerging technologies. So, so with regards to standards, of course, uh, as new risks um, and as new, let's say, uh, challenges that could be measured, that could be classified, that we can uh, find a specific approaches to govern them. Of course, the role of the standards is going to be very important, and and of course, a having a standards that are interoperable, it's key for for industry, it's key for businesses, so that they can follow and and predict and and have a a consistent uh, legal legal framework. So so I think that that, in a nutshell, I think it's very positive to see all this constellation uh, of tools playing a big part in, in into the question of how we govern emerging technologies. And we very much look forward to to follow different standard organizations work, including the OECD, including ISO and others. Thanks. Laura, thank you very much. And thank you to all of our panelists on this, uh, this panel. This was excellent. We are almost back on time. So we're going to pivot to our uh, our, our fourth panel, but, uh, Laura and Nathan and Rohit and Tanya, thank you very much for your testimony. Congressman Delaney is going to kick off the fourth panel. Great. Um, if we have our fourth panel, let's slide down. And uh, I think while we're doing that, um, I think Carissa is joining us virtually. Carissa, are you with us? Yes. Hi. 
Hi, Carissa. I think um, I may have you start. Carissa is the Associate Professor in faculty, and on the Faculty of Philosophy in the Institute of Ethics and AI, uh, and a tutorial fellow at the University of Oxford. So, Carissa, we're going to maybe do about seven minutes uh, per uh, testimony. Would you mind uh, kicking us off here while everyone gets settled out here? Thank you so much for the invitation. Can can I start? Sorry, I didn't yes. get. Yeah. Fantastic. Yes, please. Thank you, Carissa. Thank you so much for the invitation. It's such a pleasure to be here. So I um, in the ethics of AI, and in addition to being an associate professor at Oxford, um, I wrote a book called Privacy is Power, um, and I'm an author. So I would like to share with you three ideas today. One is to consider how incredible it is that today, as things stand, almost anyone can design an algorithm to do almost anything they want it to do and let it loose onto the world, into the world, without any kind of supervision. And that is incredible. If we compare that to how we deal with drugs, um, we would never allow a medicine to go out into the market before being thoroughly tested, not even in an emergency like the coronavirus pandemic. We are absolutely adamant that drugs have to go through a procedure of uh, randomized control trials and peer review. And of course, algorithms can be just as powerful and just as harmful as any powerful drug. So that should make us think twice. And one of the things I would like to propose is that we should have something like the, the FDA for algorithms, especially certain kinds of algorithms, either those that reach a huge amount of people and or those that deal with very sensitive issues in life, like whether people um, get access to healthcare or get a loan or get a job or get an apartment, and that those algorithms should be scrutinized and subjected to randomized control trials, just like we do with drugs. Uh, and if you want to know more, more about this idea, I wrote a piece in the Harvard Business Review in which I detail it uh, a bit more. A second idea that I wanted to share with you today is that to invite you to, to think together more closely about the distribution of risk in society. A lot of the talk around AI is veering towards talk of risk in different ways, whether it's assessing how much risky an AI is to, um, to using AI in general to minimize risk, especially for institutions. Um, within this idea, I would like us to ask ourselves two questions. One is, what is the nature of risk? And very often in these conversations, it seems like we're treating risk as if it's something very objective. But risk is not objective. The idea of risk always has a lot of assumptions. Among other assumptions, there is a, a question of risky for whom? And it's not objectively risky, ever. <laughs> so one of the things I worry about is that in the way we're deploying AI is changing the distribution of risk in society in problematic ways, especially in the financial sector. So this might have an effect similar to the kind of effect that we had during the financial crisis in 2008. And that effect was that previously, it was banks that shouldered most of the risk when it came to loans, individual banks. They knew who they were lending money to, and if things went wrong and the person couldn't pay back the loan, the bank was in trouble. Now, when we designed these very complex financial instruments such that you could sell them and people, but other banks could buy them and not know what they were buying and then sell them on, and there was a disconnect between uh, the, the people that make, made the risky decisions and the people who were going to pay the price for when things went wrong. And what we saw was that suddenly the risk got pushed onto the shoulders of individuals who couldn't bear that risk and when things went south, uh, that had in turn an, a, a systemic effect on all society. And I think we might be facing a similar kind of risk in which uh, we use an AI to minimize risk for an institution, whether it's a bank or whatever other institution. And it seems like this is a good thing because it's minimizing risk, but it's actually just pushing risk onto the shoulders of individuals rather than shouldering risks as a community and, and, and as a group of people who have many more resources to shoulder risk. The third idea that I would like to share with you 
uh, today is the idea that privacy is really something fundamental in how we think about how we regulate AI, and in particular, how we regulate AI to support democracy. So if you want to know more about these ideas, uh, you can find them in my book, Privacy is Power, but the gist of it is what we're doing right now in selling and buying personal data is incredibly reckless. For the same reasons that we don't buy or sell votes in democracies, we shouldn't buy or sell personal data because at the end of the day, it gets used much the same effect. Uh, it's not only going against merit because we're not being treated as equal citizens anymore and we're not being treated on the basis of what we do, but on the basis of who we are and what our data says about us. Uh, it's eroding democracy in all the ways that we're seeing, including Cambridge Analytica type effects, but also polarizing society and so on. And my most important worry is that this system of surveillance would be catastrophic in the hands of an authoritarian regime. Democracy is not in its best moment. We have international rivals who are very good at hacking and who don't have much respect for democracy. And surveillance is not a neutral tool. Surveillance always leads to control, and control inevitably erodes freedom. So instead of moving away from a system like China's techno-authoritarian style, we're actually trying to compete with them. And I think that's, this is a mistake. This is a time to defend our liberal values and for democracies of the world to come together. China is exporting surveillance to 150 countries. This is incredibly risky. It's not only that, that they have access to incredibly sensitive data that they can use to export public officials um, to find out military secrets, secrets and so on, but it's also the case that by having access to these smart cities, they can turn them off. And that we're giving access to such an important rival is incredibly reckless. So given that China is exporting surveillance, our job as liberal democracies is to export privacy. Mm. Through legal standards, through culture, and especially through technology that supports democracy and doesn't erode democracy. So, Carissa, I'm, I'm not asking you to start wrapping up, so... That was the end. Thank you so much. Oh, that was the end. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Carissa. Uh, and if you could uh, hang with us a little bit, we'll be opening up for questions uh, shortly. So, our uh, next panelist is Julie Dawson. There you are. Okay, Julie who's the chief, uh, of policy, uh, the chief Policy and Regulatory Officer at Yodi. Thank, Thank you, you so Julie. much. Um, I did share with Michael some slides. I don't know if those were um, able to be transferred to people. But if not, I will kick off. And yeah, I emailed those around as well as it's on the... Fabulous. Stunning. Thank you so much. Um, so Yodi is a company which provides identity, age, and these signatures. Um, founded about seven years ago, and in the last three to four years, we've developed a really unique AI tool to assess age. We're a B corporation, so we look at the triple bottom line, and we're really quite unusual in having right from the beginning set up our policies <laughs> and set up an external ethics council. So looking at the human rights, consumer rights, last mile tech, accessibility, and online harms elements, which is pretty rare for a company that at the time had under 50 people. So now, wind forward seven years, we're nearly 500 people, and we're leading very much in this area of age assurance. We take part in the standards bodies around age assurance, but I think what's interesting, if I can try and put you in the shoes of a company that started three to four years ago in developing an AI age estimation approach that had a pedigree of wanting to do things the right way, um, and try and help you be a fly on the wall of a small company that's trying to do this in the right way. So what drove this was the fact that if you looked at age assurance, you've over a billion people on the planet that don't have documents. And that was the classic way of proving age, or going through credit reference companies. And if you could tell someone what price your sofa was on a monthly basis, they'd probably think that you were Fred Smith. But actually, if you really knew it was $4.26 rather than $7.92, you were more likely to be the fraudster. So we wanted to look at what could there be ways that would be inclusive to assess age. A third of users on the internet globally are actually minors. And how do we protect them? If you take an analogy with the automobile, it took 100 years from the first automobile for us to make car seat belts and car seats mandatory for children. Are we going to wait 100 years before the internet has the same approaches for children? 
So around the world now, there's a really complex legislative environment around online safety evolving. You have children's codes evolving, for example, in the UK, in Ireland, in the Netherlands, in Canada, in Australia, specifically age-appropriate design codes. You also have bill on statute books coming through in California. You have in 11 countries around the world looking at specific legislation around age-appropriate access to adult content. And across the whole of Europe, the Digital Services Act, the Audiovisual Media Services Act has the same requirement. So we thought, how do you make age assurance workable and how do you make it so it's inclusive? And hence, we actually looked at the data we had, which was quite unique from the identity part of our business. We have over 11 million people that have set up a reusable identity app. And through that, we had this really unique ground truth. And we started to test that for use for AI. What was unusual was that we already had our external ethics council. We were then able to work with the Centre for Democracy and Technology, the Future Privacy Forum, the World Privacy Forum. And we started doing regular roundtables to get input and learn, which is pretty unusual for a company that was then scaling from 500. And then over the years, we'll soon be holding our fourth regulatory roundtable on facial age estimation. Crucially, and you can see the details on the slides, this is not facial recognition, because we're not training it with knowing that this is Michael or Adam or Brent. There's no details, there's none of your addresses in there. We just give it the ground truth of a face with month and year of birth. So when it sees a new face, it can look at it, do a pixel level analysis, and spit out 22, 46, 59, and give that age assessment. The majority of age assessments are really from your sort of 13 to 25 years, where most of the age restricted goods are think pharmaceuticals, think alcohol, think vaping, think cannabis, think adult content. And so around the world, there's now this really complex set of laws that governments are on the one hand saying to companies, e commerce companies, or content providers, we've got to abide by these laws. We don't want age restricted goods and services going to minors. On the other hand, you have techniques such as this one coming through, which instantly deletes the image when it assesses age, is not a facial recognition. Um, and one of the things we've had to do is publish really regularly the updated mean absolute errors and work on the transparency around that. So we were really fortunate here in the UK, we have something called the ICO Sandbox. We were part of that. We were one of only a handful of companies that were selected to be part of the Sandbox. And that helped us do two things. So we did a whole education campaign, creating materials that could be understood by your seven-year-old at home or by your grandparent age, you know, 70 to 90 plus. And we looked at plain English. So we used things like the, it's the Fleischmann matrix of looking at a sentence and looking at how understandable was it. Could a 10-year-old understand this? And bizarrely, we actually found those were the most helpful things also when speaking with regulators. Because not everybody has got a PhD in AI. Um, so by actually having really short explainer videos, simple materials, that has proved really, really useful. But how to help other companies do on this journey? So in our white paper and in our round tables and through blogs, we've tried to chart this journey of how have we gone about demystifying what we're doing. At the moment, for instance, um, we're working on a survey, an experiential survey for 9 to 14 year olds who can understand more about what's under the hood, how you create an AI algorithm, um, especially that fact it's not recognizing anyone, so it's facial analysis. They can actually have a go of it and give us their opinions before and after. So, this approach is now, we've done over 550 million of them in the last about 18 months. We have some really large global set of social network companies, gaming companies, games console companies looking at this approach. But I had a few specific points, with specifically the, the sort of the, the rollout of it and what should regulators look at? Because um, there's a lot of nuances in this. So a platform could say, oh yes, we've integrated IoT. We're, we, we're integrated, we're good to go. Hmm. But actually, we as a company can't see how many of their users they are actually age verifying. We can't see if they're doing that some of the time or all of the time. They can integrate and say, yes, they've integrated with us. But they could, on the other hand, be disingenuous and do absolutely nothing with that age assessment. We would never know. So this then begins some conversation with regulators actually saying, and also documentary makers, how do they check up on the platforms that say they've actually integrated and have these techniques? 
For instance, we worked with a BBC documentary film a few years ago, and on a given platform that supposedly said they were doing everything great, over 33% of the over 18 supposedly on the platform were under 17 on a given day. So there was an example of them using one of our tools to see if what a platform said it was doing was actually working. Um, and going forward, we're seeing that some regulators are actually looking at using things like avatars, so they themselves can be using these sorts of techniques to sort of do test purchasing effectively. Other things that we would suggest is they have, you have to look at the nuances of when an age account is being set up, is it for one-off uses? Is it for multiple usages? Um, there are tokenized approaches, so that if somebody is maybe signing up and going on to a type of site, and going on to lots of similar age verified sites over a few hours, they're not necessarily every time putting in their age. But then the regulators have to decide, well, how do these tokens work? How long should they last? May I ask you to start? Yep, to yep, yep. Just doing with another couple of conclusions. If you go to the slide, it's slide five, where I've actually put the different elements, but I think are things that regulators need to look at this. Um, so we need to look at, is there independent external audits? So do companies such as ours actually delete the image when they do, for instance, a facial age analysis? Are they taking part in the standards development? Do they have um, an overview or ethics board that looking at the positive and negative intended and unintended consequences? We use the dot everyone matrix, for example, for this. And bodies such as the Ada Lovelace Citizens Biometrics Council Oversight Panel was one that we took part in. But many of the small companies don't have that luxury. So that's a quick whistle stop. So I hope it's helped you see through an example from a scaling company. Thank you. Very helpful. Thank you, Julie. Um, Siva Shamarti. Yeah, hi. Um, hi, guys. Uh, oh, thanks right. for the opportunity. And uh, thanks for being here. I'm head of ML Engineering at uh, Shell. And I have a colleague. Um, I'm Amy Chadwick. I'm. Amy um, GM, General Manager, Artificial Intelligence, Shell. Okay. Um, so I'm responsible for development and delivery of AI algorithms. Um, we're going to share this slot, if that's okay. That's fine. I would love to say that that allows you 14 minutes, but <laughs> we're going to have to keep with our seven minutes, seven if minutes. that's okay. That's absolutely right. Great. So I think we um, had comments to make about six areas around the promotion of AI. <laughs> Sorry. Um, and to how to, to make sure that the industry doesn't get ahead of itself. So these were people, um, research funding, data, standards and IP, startups and hardware. I'll go through those as well. So I think one of the things that we've found a particular challenge in our current roles um, is people. It's very, very hard to get the right skill sets. Um, and but a big part of that can be just about business, realistically. If you really want business of rare skill set, there aren't that many people training even now. Um, when so many more universities have developed AI masters and so forth, but even so, it's a rare skill set. And if you haven't got free movement of people to actually take up a job, it's really hard. It's hard for a company of the size of Shell. It is immeasurably harder for startups. And um, I think one of the things that we don't think about so much here is we often think about it at the business level rather than the pipeline level. If universities, you know, the reason we have a large number of people hanging around Houston or London or wherever it is, with the right skill set is because they came to university here, they come from somewhere else. If the universities are not finding it easy enough to, to acquire visas for people to come and study, then the whole pipeline gets gets clogged and we're not going to have people locally who are able to join our company. So that's one thing I'm particularly concerned about in the UK context. I don't know whether it's better or worse in the US. It's worse. Um, it's worse. <laughs> Good to know. Um, because even if it's okay for Shell, once people are already based in London, we can, do, we can go through that process. It's really hard for these universities, and we have some excellent universities, but sometimes they're just finding it too hard to support people. I think also things like this are visas for conferences. Um, one of my team members is a Chinese national. Um, she's been unable to get visas to go to the US to do the conference. Now, that's not the end of the world. There are all sorts of ways we can do things remotely, but it does prevent the kind of free flow of ideas, and that's a pity. Um, I also think if you're thinking longer run, Education. I mean, I don't know whether it's something like um, subsidising fees at undergraduate level or postgraduate level for those who study STEM subjects of the right kind. Clearly, that's a huge burden in many countries now, the fees. And in some ways, maybe people are studying hard stuff subjects. Second one is research funding. Um, I think we've seen a lot of research sponsorship through funding universities, co funding, so half government funding, research institutes, half stars. And these are fantastic. These are actually really successful. But I think sometimes the IP clauses don't quite work by the size of it, particularly because if we're 
talking about very sensitive data that we're using internally because we're working on the energy transition and it's important to us that um, what we're working on we can actually paint into the future. Um, if it's that important, then obviously we won't paint it, we'll make it freely available. There's lots of stuff here which is really quite competitive against it. So we have to be careful about what IP we release and therefore it's, it's quite hard sometimes with the IP clauses if they're not fully aligned with what we're trying to do. Um, I don't think there's one answer there. It's just making sure that there's kind of clarity on that and that there's a work ahead. Um, and I think there's also a big opportunity for expended tax breaks for expenditure on, on being carried out locally because in, in local investment of people, whether they're local people or non-local people, is a huge part of making sure that you maintain the skill set. And I think particularly in high cost locations like the US, it doesn't just get outsourced to another country and that you maintain that skill set in, in locations. Because while clearly there's a huge strength you know, in some areas, there's a good insane to go elsewhere, there's this constant push or pressure to go to the gym. Hand over to you with the data. Um, you perfectly divide the time. Right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm on the data, right? Like, uh, so when we are working on some, on some of the projects, so we have to go through all the regulatory compliance. We follow the, the strictest. Whatever is strict across the region, we take that and we apply. We spend a lot of time in order to clear that. So what can we do to decrease that time? Is like that. Maybe what we can do is like a, we might have some kind of a data banks where they can anonymize this data and make that available to all people, not just big organizations, like even for the startups, right? So that they can spend more time uh, working on like uh, an algorithms and then how uh, they can uh, push that boundary kind of stuff, like uh, to developing those algorithms kind of thing, right? Like uh, so completely respect the, the human rights and the privacy kind of stuff, but this database can enforce um, all that anonymization and um, and data privacy kind of things, right? So uh, so that's what uh, we were thinking, like um, I think better to have something like that, or like uh, we might need to think about like uh, how data can be easily accessible to multiple partners who can work on the AI. Um, that's one thing, and uh, regarding uh, the standards and IP protection, right? Like, uh, so who will be uh, responsible uh, for the applications? Like, because when we have like this partnership and uh, the data, because the data is a key to develop any AI algorithms. So now we're bringing all these partners. That who will be actual responsible for the whole patent if you patent that? Um, that's one thing, and as well as like um, the what to talk about yeah, ethics. I, I suppose, I mean, partly it's reiterating what Chris was saying about standards and, and others as well earlier. Um, you can think of it in a number of ways. I think it's very important to have the right process, so like a height mark for um, how do you follow the right kind of process in there. It's hard to assess outcomes in every case, but it, it, and you don't want to do a stranglehold where you have to assess every AI algorithm that goes out there, even though it's low impact. But certainly, you wouldn't build a major bridge where it has hundreds of vehicles going across it without actually having some kind of external validation. So any high impact algorithms, there should be some sort of method of assessment, and otherwise it should be some sort of self-assessment at a high mark process. Um, similarly, just having consistent standards, I think it's really interesting how, um, as a new field, there isn't standard set um, standards, and actually funding the development of that framework can be a very useful thing for um, um, uh, regarding um, again the, the startup kind of stuff, like uh, I think uh, the government uh, needs to provide funding uh, so that it can be uh, distributed, not just concentrated like uh, only few people are developing algorithms kind of stuff, right? So um, the other one is like uh, provide uh, good. And what we found out was like uh, the explainability and all that stuff, right? Like uh, it's not that much mature, I think uh, the more funding and more research needs to happen because a lot of times we, what we found out was we need domain experts in order to interpret and then try to find out if there is a bias and all that stuff, right? So so there should be a lot of funding and research activity needs to happen um, in that level as well. And as well as like the hardware, right? Like what we found out was like uh, when we look at the AI hardware, AI chipset, it's so very few companies are making and then like, uh, and and the chipset manufacturing needs to be local because 
now it's completely dependent on some third party country providing those chips and all that stuff. Right? Mm -hmm. so, and then in order to make it competitive, I think uh, they should be um, uh, distributed across uh, quite many players need to be there in that. And then there are quite a lot of uh, new chipsets coming into the picture, like uh, neural market computing kind of stuff to make our edge solutions more greener and all that stuff, right? Yep. But there are not many out there. There are only very few companies who are developing those chipsets. And and may wrap up. Yeah. Um, so what we need to do is like there should be more funding uh, in order to help do that. that. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you. Uh, for your combined testimony. So, um, last but certainly not least, we have Sasha, is it Hako? Hako. who is the founder of Unitary AI. Sasha? Thanks so much, thanks for having me here. So, um, I'm the, one of the founders and CEO of a startup called Unitary. Um, so, as you will likely have experienced yourselves in your own daily communication with family, friends, and colleagues, an increasing proportion of our conversations and interactions take place uh, online. And this is a trend that's only been strengthened by the COVID 19 pandemic. Whilst the ability to instantly connect with people um, around the world has enabled millions of billions of people to maintain their relationships and exchange ideas, people's experience of um, online spaces can vary very wildly. Too many users are exposed to violent imagery and digital content with little to no control over what they see in their feed. This challenge will only become more acute due to the ever-growing volume of online content. Between 2020 and 2025, some estimates suggest that the amount of information on the internet is set to grow by a factor of 10. Then this, the growth of video content in particular considerably adds to the complexity. Today, video makes up over 80% of all online traffic and is concentrated on social networks and platforms. Video presents its own unique moderation challenges it can cause significant harm to users, and so requires urgent attention. But it's also more time-consuming um, for human moderators, and requires significantly more complex technological solutions than it's are best. Across the globe, policymakers are moving to address harmful online content, as simply touched upon before, so that everyone can have a safer um, online experience. The UK's proposed online safety bill, for example, aims to establish a new regulatory framework to tackle harmful content online. Under this framework, social media companies and platforms that host user-generated content would have the duty of care to enforce their own terms and conditions by proactively identifying and removing illegal and legal but harmful content. Given the huge scale and complexity of the moderation challenge, human reviewers cannot and they should not have to tackle this alone, particularly in light of the emotional toll the human reviewers experience owing to repeated exposure to abusive and traumatic content. Automated solutions present the only option for effective moderation that can both keep up with the pace and scale of the challenge and does not come at a cost to human reviewers and health. Advances in AI and machine learning present new opportunities for more successful moderation to identify and flag content before it can cause harm to users. The fields of large language models and computer vision are being advanced every day as researchers and organizations like Unitary are training models to be able to have more and more human-like understanding of text and visual content. Recent developments in the space of large language models, for example, have demonstrated an impressive applicability across a wide range of tasks. At the same time, development in the field of AI ethics are key to ensuring that AI is applied in a fair and transparent manner, which I know is a theme here. In the field of large language models and foundational models more generally, Stanford University last year released a paper mapping out the risk landscape when it comes to safety-based issues. And they highlight issues such as fairness, privacy, and bias, as well as exploring the potential ethical implications of using these models for society at large. Both the developments in the models themselves, as well as their interrogation for resolving issues, suggest an exciting path forward in the potential of AI to solve real-world problems, such as content moderation and online safety. A central feature to the content moderation challenge is the need to simultaneously understand multiple modalities, such as text, audio, and image content. As humans, when we watch a video, we see the imagery at the same time as we hear the sounds and can interpret the context of the video by reading any titles or comments. So for example, a YouTube video that's titled, What Makes Up the Gun, 
might be informative and educational, or providing instructions on how to build a gun for the purposes of inciting violence. And as humans, we're capable of distinguishing between these two scenarios because we can consider all the various signals of that view. Multimodal machine learning models are beginning to play a key role in content moderation, and this space is another area that is benefiting from very fast-paced innovation today. OpenAI, for example, have recently showcased their latest models, which they call DALI, which you might have been familiar with. So DALI and its successor DALI 2 are very impressive models, which have the ability to generate very high-fidelity images from fragments of text used to describe them, even in very um, obscure cases. They reveal an AI system with a deep understanding of natural language and how it relates to visual language. These types of models represent the next evolution of multimodal models capable of sophisticated applications, but require significantly more work in order to make them safely deployable at scale in industrial, industrial applications. So despite these developments, we are still at a pretty rudimentary point of content moderation, where we do not have a good understanding of content online. A key barrier is the importance of incorporating context. So, for example, nudity in the context of medical diagnosis carries very different meaning from nudity in the context of a like, sexually explicit context. And understanding content within its context is a crucial step to better categorize content and understand the internet more widely, and similarly relies on the development of highly specialized multimodal machine learning models. The unitary team is working to perfect the process of contextual content categorization online to enable more effective content moderation. But just like today's large language models, multimodal systems bring both significant opportunities and also risks. So it's therefore crucial to develop these models in a way that maximizes transparency, robustness, and explainability. We at Unitary are making great strides in analyzing the video content and enabling a better understanding of online video in context through our own research and commercial partnerships. We've made code to better detect online hate speech publicly available to encourage collaboration and transparent and foster research in this area. We've also partnered with leading, leading institutions such as the University of Oxford to advance AI research in this space, and we look forward to sharing our work with multi machine learning models soon. But central to the development of better AI models that can have really large scale positive impact is the right ecosystem that serves the community in a fair manner. Businesses and policymakers <coughs> need to work together to build a pipeline of engineers and researchers which reflect the world and can promote a community of innovators that is as diverse as it is ambitious. We also need to ensure that we have the capital ecosystem required to support the businesses at the forefront of AI research and development and allow for creative experimentation that is the heart of innovation. And finally, we need to establish AI innovation data sets and benchmarks that are representative of the real world, which starts with the ability to recognize harmful content so as to ensure that these technologies developed and applied in the fair manner. A better understanding of what makes up the internet is the first step to creating a more transparent and safe digital space. But any AI model reflects a data set upon which it is built. So I would like to suggest that the development of transformative content moderation models is really at the heart of creating a safe future for AI more widely. Thank you. Seven minutes and one second. <laughs> <laughs> Remarkable. <laughs> Even one of your machines could not do that. <laughs> uh, thank you all for your testimony, and um, why don't we open up for questions? And then I'm going to pass it on to my colleague Mike because I have to step out. Don't want to finish. Who wants to start? Commissioners? Questions? Adam. Hi, uh, Adam here with uh, the University. Uh, I heard Kite Mark for the first time today. I know some Americans will know what Kite Mark is. Maybe you can explain that. Another word is not in the American uh, vocabulary, it's Quango. And there are a lot of different quasi autonomous non governmental organizations operating in this space um, that have different standards, best practices. This connects back to earlier panelists that we heard from today. So maybe uh, just some general thoughts about the role of how standard setting organizations in various countries whether it's on safety, on uh, security, whatever else might play a role here that we could learn, uh, connecting back to what we see in the U.S. with other quangos we don't call quangos, like IEEE and AAC and others, what we can learn from how standards are set in the U.K. on, on these other issues. So 
for me, or for anyone, um, I must say, I'm, I'm not definitely not an expert on quite pie marks. I've just been in um, businesses before where we had gone through that process of something like, say, project delivery, project management. And so, what you're doing there is you're not saying this particular outcome is excellent. You're saying, in general, from what we've seen about your processes, you're going about this in the right way. And the reason I think that's a useful model for a lot of what people do, for both AI and for just digital and general software delivery, is because most of these things are not so high impact that uh, having a kind of external um, validation would be required. It's, it's just about sort of making sure that people are understanding what, is, what good looks like. Because I think often customers as well, customers of AI software, software are not informed enough. It's a very hard thing to get into, to, in, get into detail and do due diligence. So I think having that kind of high mark, that kind of validation of we've seen the way you do things, we've seen your AI ethics policy, your AI ethics external board, your, um, the way you do your training and test, all the rest of it, can be a very helpful thing. I think you also need something which is a bit heavier and a bit to, um, for where there is a high impact um, algorithm. Particularly if it's say on particular sensitive data, healthcare data, for example, or where it's um, just just high use and high impact. I, I just think it, it, it's about moderating that piece between um, allowing for a lot of innovation versus ensuring safety in the places where we need to do that. I think we have a question from Shekhar. Hey, thank you. Can you hear me okay? Yes, go ahead. Oh, perfect. There's a question for Carissa. Carissa, you argued, uh, and I like your conversation where you said that. Uh, privacy is power, and you said how uh, an equivalent of an FDA approach needs to be in place for AI as well, right? If I heard you right, now the question in my mind really is, you know, FDA really, you're talking about drugs that can ultimately kill a human being. Most of the AI use cases are not at that extreme. There could be disparities between race and religion and age and so on, I understand that, but how are they not that extreme? Second thing is pushing for such a high regulation can slow down innovation significantly. So as you have articulated, I was just curious what your thoughts are in terms of the right regulation as needed for the right risk level in terms of use case, as opposed to a blanket FDA level for anything AI. Thank you so much. So first of all, I think good regulation helps innovation because at the end of the day, uh, when we have huge scandals and people start distrusting technology, um, we end up having dysfunctional systems and dysfunctional societies. So I disagree that um, AI isn't as extreme. I think, um, for instance, just to give an example, uh, in 2013, the Michigan Unemployment Agency uh, used an algorithm to determine who was committing fraud, and it accused about 34,000 people falsely of having committed fraud. And these people not only uh, lost uh, very necessary income because they were already in a precarious situation. Um, they also many times uh, lost their families. Um, they lost, uh, th their lives were completely broken. So I think that is similar to having something like um, a physical um, disability for the rest of your life in some ways. And there have been cases in which uh, people, people actually die like if they don't get the necessary healthcare treatment, and it was because of a faulty algorithm. And this is not hypothetical, it's already happened plenty of times. So I think that um, AI is as dangerous and powerful. And of course, we can have like AI faults that um, put national security at risk. So um, I think AI can be just as dangerous as a powerful drug and in some cases even more so and the right kind of regulation will actually help innovation because we everybody wants good technology and regulation contributes to that got it thank you thank you other questions anybody else yes Karen. so um this is also for uh, carissa a lot of time today we've talked about the um anthropomizing ai and the dangers of that, based on your descri uh, descriptions, you seem to um, assign human-like traits to this a these AI systems as though they're the end uh, decision maker. However, in many cases, there are humans at the at the end of uh, this AI pipeline. So, how do you reconcile the fact that there is still a human in the loop? And and again, you seem to be advocating for this blanketed, uh, very stringent um, regulation across the board. Thank you. So 
No, I don't describe human-like abilities to AI. I wish they had it. Um, they don't have it. AI is much, much more stupider than human beings. But oftentimes we treat it as if it weren't. So yes, there's a human in the loop. Uh, in theory, in practice, many times, if the human being goes against the AI, they face a lot more risk than if they don't. So there's a lot of pressure to just go with AI. And very often, um, we're not even sure what's going on with the AI. So in the case of the Michigan Unemployment Agency, just to take a case that actually happened, so that it's not hypothetical, um, that AI did actually decide who was committing fraud. And 34,000 people were falsely, falsely accused of something. So that's just empirical reality and how we are treating AI. Any other thoughts on this? Can I go to the previous point, which was with regards to the kite mark? One of the things I think that is um, needed there then is the investment in that kite mark. If, if ISO is well known, IEEE standards are well known, but even then there's so many of them, you have to make sure that there's significant investment in both the actual marketing and rollout of that kite mark. So that it is something that small, medium and large companies can take part in. And then with regards to Krangos, I think there has been a really useful role um, in the UK played by bodies such as ADA, such as the ICO Sandbox, which is you know, a quasi-regulator. Um, and without those bodies, I, I would have thought that, that the wider public discourse would have been poorer. So I don't know if other people have engaged with other useful bodies, the Alan Turing's and others, but I think they are forming a, a really useful bridge point and an education role in this whole area. Did you have a follow-up comment to Conrad's question? I did actually, if that's okay. Um, yeah. my, my thought is about some of the very widely publicized um, failures of AI are actually, to my mind, failures in process. And actually, it doesn't matter what technology you put in there, whether it's AI or just standard process chain. If you do that in a stupid manner, because you believe in technology building and everything else, you will have massive failure. So to me, something like uh, the Michigan example and many others, it's because people believe AI is magic that they then put it in place without really testing it or really understanding it. They don't have a human glue, they don't test back, they don't do it sort of offline first. And, and then they just put it in line and go, oh, that's the AI said so, it must be right. If you did that with any process, if you did that with your Six Sigma factory improvement process, you would kill people. It's just that when people are doing it in an engineering context, they've developed, they've, they've had enough time to develop ways of process improvement that they do it in a safe manner, they use small scale testing. Well, well. I think part of the problem is the AI image. So the reason I'm saying that is because I don't, I, I genuinely don't think AI in most contexts is more dangerous than any other technology or business improvement we, we actually have. It's just that people haven't understood it and therefore have rolled it out in a very stupid, naive way. And I think this is partly why I think very clear standards could be really useful. Because if you say that we never roll out until we've had a human belief for some time and really tested this, we never, uh, we, particularly when we're looking at sort of anything that affects humans, we never actually sort of try and make decisions on these things. We just use it as, a, as a, um, an information input until we're really confident that this is going right. Those are the kind of things that help people understand what's going on and make sure it's successful. Who wants the last question? All right. Thank you all. Great panel. Great hearing. Thank you all very much for joining us. Uh, we are going to give the very last word today back to Jonathan Cooley, our host here um, at Clifford Chance. Jonathan. Well, um, thank you for an excellent uh, panel, and in particular to Carissa, we work very closely with here, and you just did a fantastic job of raising awareness on. AI risk and ethics over the years. So um, good to see you again, Carissa. And I guess to close, it's been a fascinating session. One thing that I wanted to reference was about talent, something that we haven't necessarily focused on too much, but I see as being a really big issue that our schools and education systems, universities need to tackle. And there's a couple of statistics, I guess. So in the UK at the moment, um, only one in 10 people studying computer science at A-level, uh, so 16 to 18, is a woman. So we're having 9 in 10 uh, men progressing through to study computer science. And that in itself is resulting in huge issues in the university. And when we talk about some of the challenges with AI today around bias and prejudice and uh, different communities' views not being reflected in the way it's been built, 
that's because the education system is set up actually to, to block and prevent that. And it's not just a UK issue, if you look at the US, at degree level, only 18% of the degrees in 21 were uh, awarded in computer science to women at university standard. So this starts with level setting and changing expectations uh, and the mindset of our teachers, our education system, and thinking that you know, young girls can study this subject. And I know today we haven't really focused on this in a lot of detail, but I do believe that when we're setting AI policy, we do need to think about some of the sources of these issues, and the sources start very early in our education system. Um, I'm sure we'll be continuing this discussion in drinks um, this afternoon, but I would appreciate everyone's thoughts and reflections on how we can tackle this. And at Clifford Chance, one of the things that we've done is to uh, start a foundation, a scholarship program at Oxford University to encourage people from not just different gender backgrounds, but also different economic and, and ethnicity backgrounds to study computer science. Because sadly, at the moment, I think it is a reserve that is um, the privilege and actually the white man. We do need to change that. So um, we're proud to uh, sponsor that, and we're really proud today to host what has been a, a fantastic, insightful, uh, diverse discussion. Uh, so thank you so much um, for, for being our guest today. Thank you so much. And on behalf of the United States Chamber of Commerce and our, and our panel today, thank you for having us. Thank you to all of our friends here in London for having us. It uh, met and exceeded, I think, all of our very high expectations. Uh, this is a marvelous place to visit, and uh, we are hoping to, I know I and my family are hoping to be back very soon. Uh, so we thank you for hosting us today, and we thank all of our panelists and all of our witnesses today for a great, another great hearing. Thank you all.